My name is Ebenezer Amwako Entry, and you are so welcome to this YouTube channel. On this YouTube channel, you are going to get videos that will set you up in your work with God and also with your prayer life. On this channel, you upload videos consistently to make sure that believers are guided to pray and pray and pray. If you are new to this YouTube channel, make sure that you subscribe to the YouTube channel so that when we upload new videos, you can have access to them. And also, if you don't understand anything, kindly send us a message and we will get back to you. Also, make sure that this video you are about to watch, you will like the video, try and comment on it. And when you are blessed by the video, make sure that you share it to someone. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Are you excited tonight? Are you expectant tonight? It's a night of receiving. And one of the laws that governs the protocol of receiving in the kingdom is the law of expectation. If you don't have expectations, there's not much God can do for you. The Bible said the expectation of the righteous. The expectation of the righteous shall not be cut short. Tonight, if you have an expectation, can you lift your hands toward heaven and just whisper something to the Lord? Can you tell him something very beautiful? Emmanuel. Help me now, wife. Emmanuel. Come on. Emmanuel. of transformation there is so much that depends on you because you need to cooperate with the Holy Ghost but when it comes to a healing service brother you have nothing to do you just lean on the wings of the eagles it's time for God to walk so it's a time for gratitude it's a time of appreciation can somebody just go ahead and sing to the Lord open up to Jesus what you are said to do tonight in our midst we come with hearts full of gratitude we come with hearts full of expectations because we know that your compassion faileth not we are confident that tonight there will be a massive visitation there will be massive transformations and there will be great, there will be great manifestations of your power thank you Holy Spirit we are grateful for the things you will be doing tonight we are yielded, we are open. We say, have your way. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Come on, give the Lord a big shout of praise. 
Somebody shout glory! Woohoo! Hallelujah! Praise the Lord! God bless you. You may be seated. I'll be sharing the word of the Lord with us for just 15 minutes and then we'll allow the Holy Ghost to go into action. You came here sick tonight. Be ready to say goodbye to sickness. <laughs> you came here oppressed tonight. The end of oppression is come. Can I tell you something? It's not just going to be for those who are here tonight. There's what we call digital miracles. You will call those who are at home and they will be healed instantly and they will be calling us back to give their testimonies from their houses by the power of the Holy Ghost. Oh my God. I love it when God wants to do us good. You just open up and you allow Jesus to flow through you. It's an amazing thing. It's a testament of the love of God. It's a revelation of the nature of God. His desire to bless us beyond all that we deserve. You know, if God were to give you what you deserve, wow, wow, it would be a terrible day. But thanks be to God for His mercies. He doesn't give us what we deserve. He gives us according to His mercy and His love. And that is why we receive the best. That is why we know we deserve the best. Because we don't receive what we earn. We receive what Jesus paid for. Somebody is happy tonight. Can you give the Lord a bigger shout of praise? Woohoo! Glory to Jesus. Hallelujah. I want to show you some things very quickly before we begin the midday, the miracle session. You know, demons. I told you are intelligent beings. The strength of demonic oppression is in your area of ignorance. Any area where you lack understanding is an area where devils have liberty. The moment knowledge and understanding comes to you, the devil is checked out instantly because the devil knows that he has lost his authority of dominion over you. So he, he trades and he reigns in areas of ignorance. That's why the devil will not allow you pray. Because he knows if you pray, the Holy Ghost will talk to you. That's why the devil will not allow you study the word of God. Because he knows when you study the word of God, you will discover who you are in God. That's why the devil will not allow you to go for the meetings where the revelation of God's word will be unveiled. Because he knows the day you discover, that day he loses to be the master over your life. But tonight, I'm going to be bringing you the word of the Lord. And it's not going to deliver you just from sicknesses. It's going to deliver most of you from depression. It's going to deliver you from a sense of guilt. Because the devil have kept you in a tight corner for too long. The devil has made you think that God is not happy with you. The devil has made you think that God is angry with you. The devil has made you think you are good for nothing. Because every day he comes, he reminds you that time where you committed immorality. He reminds you that time where you lied. He reminds you that time when you stole. But brother, there is something the Holy Ghost reminds us about. He reminds us about the sacrifice of Jesus. He reminds us about the blood of the Lamb. He reminds us about the love of God. He reminds us about the message of God. Because your sin is not the only thing on the slate. There is something God put on the slate. There is the blood of Jesus on the slate. And the moment the blood of Jesus came on the slate something happened. He said he blotted out every handwriting of ordinance against you. He blotted out every testimony of darkness against you. He blotted out every sin you ever committed. Why? Because the price was paid. You need to understand that God has done something. It is called the gospel. You need to understand that your crisis is not your only reality. There's a reality you have in God on the strength of what Jesus has done. That is the gospel. And I've come to share the gospel with you tonight, somebody. The gospel of Jesus. Romans 1, 17. The Bible said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. When a man is in bondage, that man has not heard the gospel. 
if you are in crisis, you have not heard the gospel. You don't need to do anything to be delivered. All you need is to believe. The Bible said in Colossians chapter 3 from verse 1 to 4. It said, oh, oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Who has bewitched you? It said you began in the spirit. You want to be made manifest. You want to be made perfect in the flesh. Is it him that walketh miracles among you? Do it by the law or by the hearing of faith. If you can only believe, there will be a performance. The angel came to Mary. He said, I know you are a virgin, but you are going to be with child by the power of the Holy Ghost. There is not going to be a sexual intercourse. You don't need to know a man. It has never happened before, but it doesn't matter because what will make the difference is the power of the Holy Ghost. How do you get there? Only believe. Can you believe tonight? Your captivity will be over. The systems of the world are designed to teach you how to live in fear. That's why they tell you the stories about the people that died of cancer. They tell you the stories about the thousands that died of hepatitis. They don't tell you the ones God healed. The systems of the world, they are designed to keep you in fear. They are designed to keep you in captivity. But if you turn to the Lord and you can see the light of the gospel, something will change forever in your life. Tonight, people will not just be healed, but people that came here sick will go with the healing anointing. And they will begin to heal others by the Spirit of God. Hey, you don't know what will happen. What I'm doing now, I'm trying, I'm putting. I'm putting, I'm putting. My soul is about to fly. I'm putting. Hey. And I just want to be where you are. Dwelling daily in your presence. I don't want to worship from afar. Draw me near to where you are. I just want to be where you are. In your dwelling place forever. Take me to the place where you are. I just want to be with you. Who loves Jesus here? Just wave. <laughs> look at that. Is the devil not a loser already? Come on, look at the people that love Jesus. Look at that. Look at that. In your presence. Worship from my father. Coming here to where you are. I want to be where you are. Dwelling in your presence. Feasting at your table, surrounded by your glory, in your presence. That's where I always want to be. I just want to be. I just want to be. John chapter 10 verse 10. The Bible said the devil cometh not but for to kill. To steal and to destroy. The manifesto of the devil was made bare. You know Jesus needed to tell us the agenda of the devil. Because it's, it's possible for you to be deceived and beguiled by the devil. You know the Bible said the devil beguiled Eve. The voice of Satan is sweet. The strategy of the devil is slippery. It sustains the capacity to lure. It sustains the capacity to beguile. So Jesus needed in clear terms to tell you the agenda of darkness. He said the devil cometh not but for to kill, to steal and to destroy. He said but I am. My visit to the earth is a contrast of everything the devil is doing. He said I am come to give you life. 
a life in abundance. If you are not aware, you may fraternize with darkness thinking there is a future. Have you been to that spot before where the devil tries to debate with you or bait something for another and then you think what you are receiving or what you are given rather is small compared to what you are receiving. The devil doesn't have a gift. Everything he has is called death. The Bible said in Acts of the Apostles chapter 10 verse 38 it said how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good delivering all that were oppressed of the devil. Sickness is an oppression of the devil. The devil will oppress you with sickness and still come to tell you that it's your fault. He will oppress you with sickness and still come to tell you there is no deliverance for you. He will want you to know that you will not be healed because of what you did yesterday. Jesus saw what you did. Did you remember that in scriptures nobody was saved in the days of Jesus because salvation was only possible by the Holy Spirit. But everybody Jesus healed were sinners. So the healing power of God is not obstructed by sin. The healing power of God is not reduced by sin because Jesus healed the sinners. And did you see and study your Bible that Jesus never asked anybody why he was sick. He didn't care whether it was your ancestors that did something. He didn't care whether it was your sin that did something. All he was interested in was to do good because the anointing upon his life came to do you good. So brothers and sisters, that story the devil is telling you just expired a moment ago because your sin cannot stop you from the healing power of God. The reason you put away your sin is because you have understood the love of God. The reason you put away your sins is because you have become a reasonable Christian. You have seen the sacrifice that Jesus paid for you. So it is no longer reasonable for you to continue in sin. You want to taste of the love of God. So your sin is not a hindrance to your healing. You are the one thinking it's a hindrance because the devil sold that idea to you. Can you tell somebody you are a candidate of divine health? How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Did you notice that it was not the sick people that were running after him? The Bible said he went about. He went about. Jesus is more interested in healing you that you are than you are interested in receiving healing. Because some of you think you need to do something to receive healing. Jesus doesn't care what you need to do. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Who went about the Madarin maniac, the Gadarin maniac. He was on another side of the sea, mad and locked in the tomb. Jesus finished a crusade. He was supposed to be tired that evening, but he did something. He had to cross over the river because there was a sick man on the other side of the tomb. He finished the crusade. He was tired. He was exhausted. He had every right to rest, but because of what was troubling him, he could not sleep because there was somebody sleeping in the grave. He had to go across the borders and he healed the Gadarin maniac and he turned back immediately. So the reason Jesus took the stress of crossing the sea was not because he wanted to visit the city. There was one man sick. Because of one man, God can travel from Lagos to Edo State. Because of one man's sickness, the Holy Spirit can leave Makodi and come to Edo State. He passes by your city tonight. Are you going to receive? It's your choice. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Can you ask the Lord for healing tonight? All you need to do is to ask, brother. He said, ask, you shall receive. Seek, you shall find. Knock, the door shall be opened unto you. He didn't say repent and be healed. He said, ask and you shall receive. Is it important to repent? Yes, because God cannot walk with a sinner. But receiving the bounties and the goodness of God is not a function of repentance. That was why salvation did not come to you before you repented. Salvation came to you and you began to repent after you got saved. You now understood that you are walking with God now so you cannot continue the old way. Are you listening to me, somebody? There is a free ticket of healing tonight for anybody who can believe, for anybody who will wish to receive. I want to share with you something this evening. I call it spiritual insurance. There is something God has put in stock for you perpetually to walk in dominion in this life. It's a spiritual insurance. When you work with a company, they have, they have packets, packages. There are packages for your healing. In a company, they will put what they call medical package, health package. 
if the secular system understand much how much more your heavenly father there are packages that god have put in place for your perpetual walk in freedom and in liberty one of them is called the sacrifice on the cross the cross so long as the cross remains in eternity there is an insurance for you i want to tell you the implication of the cross you know most people carry the crucifix they don't even know what it means it has become a religious thing the cross is beyond a religious a religious show of a crucifix the sign of the cross is not uh, <laughs> the cross the cross what is the implication of the cross the first thing the cross stands for is that the cross is the great divide the cross is the statement that God made that it was possible for life to begin from death the cross is the journey from death to life the cross is the point where God deals with the old creation so that the newness of the new creation can emanate anybody that have journeyed through the cross have no judgment on his shoulders anymore because the judgment that God has on the sinner is on the cross that is why if you don't accept Jesus you will be judged if you have accepted Jesus every judgment that is meant for you is already on Jesus on the cross any man who has passed through the cross in the economy of the father he's already dead so God cannot see his sins God cannot see his iniquity when God looks at the old man the old man was crucified the old man was dead the person God looks at now is the new man that resurrected in Christ Jesus and that man is perfect it's called the cross the cross is an insurance policy that is the policy that deals with guilt that is the policy that deals with depression yes when you come out of the cross in the eyes of the father you are perfect that's why you don't approach the father in the name of Simon you don't approach the father in the name of Matthew you approach the father in the name of Jesus because anybody that comes out of the cross has one habitat it's in Christ that one is in Christ that one is in Christ because he has journeyed to the cross the cross is the divide between the old man and the new man the cross is where the judgment and the anchor of God was, was placed you know when you see now sometimes God will want to kill you because the wages of sin is death but when you sin and God wants to kill you that death he has already put it on Jesus because God saw the sin you will see tomorrow so all the anger he had in his mind he has already killed you in Christ it's called the cross it's a technology that transcends time and space you know if the cross cannot deal with your future sin you couldn't be born again because you and I died after Jesus resurrected and the sins we sin if we confess Jesus today it is forgiven by what technology is it forgiven it's called the cross every time you fall and God wants to hit you that punch he wants to give you he gave it already 2,000 years ago you are the one who is manifesting it now but the father has already afflicted you the father has already dealt with you that's why he said he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement of our peace was upon him by his stripes we were healed he didn't say we are healed he said we were healed God knew you would be sick tomorrow. That is why he put the ceiling on the cross. God knew you would sin tomorrow. That is why he put the forgiveness on the cross. God knew you were going to fall tomorrow. That's why the forgiveness is on the cross. So every time Satan shows up and say, hey sinner, look at Satan and say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He will say, but you sinned yesterday. You say, no, no, no. Satan, look at the cross of Jesus. Jesus hung on the cross. I was there with him. I was there. I was included. It's called the economy of the cross. It is your perpetual insurance. Your perpetual. Listen, I thought about consecration yesterday. I thought about priesthood yesterday. I know the place of kingdom responsibility. But I'm telling you what you need to know so that you can never be a slave of the devil. It's called the cross. Is it that you died with him? That you died. You don't have a life anymore. That's why Paul said in Galatians 2.20, he said the life that I live now in the flesh it is the life of the son of God who died for me it is called the journey of faith every time I walk I walk with my shoulders high because I know the accuser of the brethren can't come near I understand that the cross paid the price my mistakes they hung on the cross 
My accusation, they hung on the cross. My judgment, it hung on the cross. Would that give me a license to continue in sin? No, because I was not the one hanging on the cross. It was somebody else that died for my pain. It was somebody else that died for my sickness. So every time I want to live my life, I will live with an understanding that the sorrows that should come to me, somebody else bore it. So my life becomes a perpetual gratitude to Jesus. So the cross is not a license for sin. The cross is a revelation of gratitude. I sinned. They were supposed to shoot me. And then my brother shows up and says, I am Michael. And then they killed him. Everything I'm supposed to, he is supposed to do while he's alive, I will do it for him. That's why Paul said, be a reasonable Christian. You will not be forced, but it behoves you to be reasonable. He had a family. He had a life. But he died for you. What do you do? You become a reasonable Christian. So everything Jesus would have loved, everything Jesus would have done, I will do it in this life. So when you look at me, you see Jesus. Because I'm living for Jesus. It's called the technology of the cross. The cross is where the power of Satan was taken away. You know, Satan is the God of this world. Because when Adam fell, he gave him authority over this world. Satan became the ruler over this world. So everybody that is under disobedience, according to Ephesians 2 verse 2, is the son of Satan. But in the cross, something happened. We died. So we disappeared from the radar of Satan. When he looks for me, he will not find me anymore. You know why? Because I died. He can't find me. If somebody dies, what happens? He goes six feet below. You check him in the registers on the earth, you won't find him. He is deleted from the world. When I entered the cross with Jesus, I vanished from the radar of Satan. And every power Satan has over me, something happened. The Bible said he spoiled principalities and powers. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in victory. Where was that done? On the cross. Colossians 2, 14 and 15. This is why we have assurance. We don't have assurance because we fast and pray. We have assurance because the price was paid by Jesus. The cross. Is the system of kingdom insurance the cross? Every time I go to God to demand something, I don't come kneeling there and say, Lord, look at me, a humble sinner. No way. Thank you, Father, because I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Thank you because the price was paid. I come boldly before the throne of grace. Paul said, Come boldly. Ah, no, no, no. On the account of the cross, I have become the child of God. When God looks at me, he looks at Jesus because I have no life anymore. I only appear in Christ. Imagine if you are going to ask your father for breakfast and then you need that and say, Daddy, please, can we have breakfast? You don't know what a child is. You don't understand the love of the father. If you know your father loves you, he will come on and say, Come on, Dad. There's no food in this house. Why is there no food in this house? Mama, I need to eat because I'm hungry. Why? You have become a son. And as a son, you have legitimate right to the things of the kingdom. Healing is not something we beg for, we command it. He said, healing is the children's bread. We command it. See, when you see a preacher operating, he's not operating the way he's operating because he's a preacher. When I begin to minister to the sick here, I'm not going to come and say, Lord, please heal them. No way. I will look at you and say, be healed. You know why? I command it. When you understand it, if sickness comes to you, you say, Satan, where are you coming from? Come on, pain. Get out of my body. Pain, get out. Satan can't even cough around you because he knows you have understanding. You have understanding. The cross is where Jesus took the shame. In, in Philippians chapter 2 from verse 5 to 9, the Bible said he was God. But he didn't count it robbery to share his equality with God. He stripped himself of the garment of divinity. You don't know what the cross is. You don't know. You don't know. You don't know. When we talk about the sacrifice of the cross, many don't understand it. They don't understand it. The cross is where the greatest revelation of the love of God was displayed. You don't understand. Do you know what it means? Maybe they now call my brother here and say there is a crisis in the pig kingdom. You need to become a pig. And then you go into the pig kingdom and you suffer the life of pigs. You will live in, in mud. You will eat feces. You will become a pig and then you will die as a pig so that every pig can be justified. And you know the problem? You will never be a man anymore. Even if you come in our midst, you will remain a pig forever. Right now in heaven, 
Jesus cannot appear as a God. In heaven, he is still a man. Why? He descended to the level of creation because he needed to deliver you. Do you know what it means if you look into an aquarium and they say this fish needs to deliver other fish? Or they tell you, son, become a fish and then you enter the aquarium because you want to deliver the fishes. And then when the fish are delivered, you can never be a man anymore. You always remain a fish. It's the power of the cross. That's why it was sufficient to pay for your sins. Is it good to continue in sin? Paul said, God forbid. But we know we cannot be tied in bondage. When we look at what Jesus did, we break out with thanksgiving. It takes love to do that. It takes love. I'm sure of the love of God for my life. I'm sure about it. I don't need anybody to tell me God loves you. Because I understand the sacrifice on the cross. I have confidence in the love of God. That's why if I sin, I don't run away from God. I run to God. God gave David three options. Either to be slain by his enemies for three years. Or to suffer plagues for seven years. Or to come to God and allow God to deal with him. He said, God, you better deal with him. Because in God, there is plenty of redemption. When you sin, you don't run away from God. You run to God. That's where your hope is. Because on the cross, he demonstrated the highest level of love. The cross is the greatest mystery of all, of all existence. There are four absolutes that you can never contradict. Two of them particularly because of what I'm teaching is justice and mercy. What mercy demands is that whatever the case is, just let go. But what justice demands is that the penalty for every offense must be paid. So if God wants to display mercy, it will be at the expense of justice. If God wants to display justice, it will be at the expense of mercy. But because his nature is a just nature and at the same time a merciful nature, he cannot choose one against the other. On the cross, God was able through divine intelligence to demonstrate both justice and mercy at the same time. The price of sin was completely paid for and the penalty of death was levied. And then the mercy of God was completely paid for because every sinner was exonerated. How was that possible? Is the mystery of the cross. Because God himself took the penalty so that you who is a sinner can be let go. So mercy was demonstrated in the highest feet and then justice was demonstrated in the highest feet. It's called the mystery of the cross. That's why on the cross every principality was disarmed. That was where the devil was shamed. Because the devil sinned in heaven. There was no way he could be redeemed. So when the devil deceived man and man fell, the devil thought man too was doomed. You don't know what happened in heaven before you were created. There was actually a boast. Oh, let me tell you a, a, a quick story in eternity past. What gave God pleasure in eternity past was Lucifer. Lucifer was the reflection of the greatest beauties in all of the creation of God. If God wanted to derive pleasure, what he needed to do was Lucifer to come on the display. Oh, you need to study about the credentials of Lucifer. I did a teaching on the seven credentials of Lucifer to teach you the, the dangers of pride. I did a teaching. You need to know who Lucifer was. Aish. The Bible called him the son of the morning. The Bible called him thou that sealed the sun. What it means is that Lucifer was brighter than the sun in glory. If Lucifer shows up like this, you don't need the sun. The sun will go dim. That was the glory that the man, the being carried. It was a reflector of light in the heights of the heavens. Lucifer was the one that conducted the worship in heaven. The Bible said from the day of thy creation, thy types and thy tablets were indeed. So if God needs to be happy, Lucifer just needs to show up. He will do like this. Heaven will be full of joy. He understood the mood of God. He could create the mood of heaven. Every time anything needs to happen in heaven, sound is the one that conducts it. And Lucifer was the governor of sounds. He was called the anointed cherub. That means he was the only one that God was smeared upon. So he could relate with God intimately. He knew the mind of God. He was called the merchandise of beauty and wisdom full of glory. But when pride entered, he, he fell from glory. 
he fell. Even God himself lamented. He said, Oh, Lucifer, how art thou fallen? Oh, do you know when a creator begins to wait? A creator is one that can just say, Come and speak, and something else will happen. But when Lucifer fell, that was a big loss. Oh, Lucifer, how art thou fallen? So God now decided, because Lucifer feels he was proud, God now decided to create another being to replace him. That being will become his object of love. And this time around, the glory of the being God wanted to create will not be in the outside. It will be on the inside. Because Lucifer was covered with ten precious stones. The Bible said he was clothed with diamond. He was clothed with sapphire. He was clothed with topaz. He was clothed with kabuku. He was clothed with ten precious stones. So, when he shows up, you see beauty and glory. So, God said, no. I will create another being that will be better than you. And this one, I will not use stones to decorate him. I will use my spirit to decorate him. But he will be on his inside. That was when God embarked on the creation of man. So man became the pride of God. Man became the revelation of God's intelligence. Man became the reflection of God's architectural masterpiece. And man became the thing that gave God pleasure. Did you remember the first time Jesus showed up? That was the first time the perfect man appeared on heaven, on earth. And God said, this is my beloved son. In whom... I am well pleased. The first time God was pleased in creation after the fall of Lucifer was when Jesus showed up. The reason is because Adam would have been the man that God was well pleased in. But Lucifer truncated the process. He caused that man to, to fall so that the man would be doomed like him. But God came back in Jesus Christ and restored the human race so that he will still be pleased in man. That possibility only exists in the cross. Lucifer knew you were his replacement. Everything he stood for, the glories of Lucifer, the beauty of Lucifer, everything God gave you a thousand times more. So Lucifer will fight you from shining. He will fight you from walking in glory. Did you notice the Bible said, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You were created for glory because you were the replacement of Lucifer. That's why in your system there are sounds. Do you notice? Let me not go there. I will, I will get lost. Lucifer knew that you were the beauty of creation. So he wants to destroy you. But on the cross, every attempt of Lucifer was futile. The Bible said that the princes of this world had known. Because when Jesus showed up, the guy knew the day the Son of God appears. That day his dominion will end. So he went and looked at him. He began to fight him. He said, are you the Son of God? Because everybody that shows up, he strikes. When Noah showed up, he struck him. Abraham showed up, Taka. Moses showed up, Taka. Anybody that comes to a point to demonstrate a feat as if he was the son of God, he will fight until Jesus showed up. For Moses, he caught up with him in anger. And he found something for everybody. For Samson, he caught up with him in immorality. But when Jesus came, he came and he didn't find anything. He said, The prince of this world come to me and find it nothing. And that was why Jesus paid the price. For you and I to become the glory of God. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 1. He said man is the glory of God. The revelation of God's essence is called man. But all of that possibility is on the cross. The next time the devil comes to deceive you. Tell the devil. Can you check the document about the cross? When you finish reading it and understand. Come back. It's obvious you don't understand the chapter. In which the mystery of the cross was written. Go and study it. When you understand what it means, come back. Because this man you are talking to understands the cross. It is called the system of spiritual insurance. The second infrastructure we have for our insurance is called the blood. I want to come down to share these things with you so that it will, it will echo in your mind for a long time. Even if you don't know the doctrine, let it be in your mind. That because of the cross you can't be condemned. In Romans chapter 8, verse 1, it says, For now there's no condemnation for them that are in Christ Jesus. Who walk not after the law of the flesh, but after the law of the spirit. When you understand it and your life is controlled by it, you are invincible. The devil can't fight you. That's why the Bible said, concerning the believer, it says, as the wind bloweth, and thou listest not from where it's cometh or where it goes. It said, So are they that are born. Of the spirit of God. Your life is a proof that there is life after death. That's why we are confident about him, confident about him, immortality. 
you are a proof that there is life after death because you were born from the cross. Next time they ask you about your genealogy, don't go back to your great grandfather, go to the cross. Some people will come and tell you, they say, oh, your ancestors buried 10 virgins. And because of the virgins they buried, everybody in your lineage is cursed, not me. I didn't come from that lineage. My genealogy is God the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, Abraham, and me. God the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, Abraham, Jesus, and because Jesus is the seed of Abraham and all of us emanate from him. It's the system of the cross. That's why I can't be cursed. I don't care all those their doctrine. They will go and explain it. They will talk about spiritual pattern. That's why a lot of people cannot be healed. You don't know the price Jesus paid. That thing affects even your flesh. He said we are now one flesh, one blood and one bone. It is the system of the cross. I can't be condemned. This is organic reality. Do Christians still commit sin? Do they still fall? Do they still make mistakes? Yes. Because all of us are a work in progress. But sin will no longer have dominion over us. Every time the devil gets us, we rise again. And we call God for mercy. And we receive grace to move forward. Because the righteous man falleth seven times. And seven times he rises again. We will never lie down and make sin a practice or a lifestyle. It's the system of the cross. We understand that we are delivered. The second infrastructure is called the blood. The blood is the silencer of the, accu of the accuser of the brethren. You know, the devil is a rebellious spirit. The devil knows you are called. He will come to you and say, Are you sure you are called? Did you study about Jesus in Matthew chapter 4? Jesus, that was the direct incarnate of God. He will come and say, If you are the Son of God, what do you mean? <laughs> do you know who you are talking to? <laughs> if you are the Son of God, you know I'm the Son of God. Why are you asking? So the devil will come and tell you, Are you sure God is happy with you? Why would God be happy with me? <laughs> Why wouldn't God be happy with me? He said, whoever is in Christ Jesus is a new creation. Behold, all things have passed away. All things have become new. Everything about me is Christ. Why won't God be happy with me? The blood of Jesus is the silencer of the accuser of the brethren. But you need to have the revelation to walk in it. In 1 John chapter 1 verse 9, he said, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sins. When you understand this revelation and you walk in it and it impacts your life and it becomes your operating system. You know, I see a lot of people come and say, I sprinkle the blood. I sprinkle. You, you are not the one to sprinkle the blood, Oga. Where is the blood you are sprinkling? They make religion out of hollow things. You don't sprinkle the blood. It's only the high priest that, that have access to the blood and it's the high priest that sprinkles the blood and Jesus is our high priest. So it's Jesus that sprinkles the blood for you. If you want to sprinkle the blood, you are dead. You know why? Between the time you fell and the time you are sprinkling the blood, what will happen to you? <laughs> it's when the attack came that you are sprinkling the blood. You would have been buried by that time if the blood was not sprinkled. <laughs> yes, I sprinkled the blood of Jesus. I sprinkled the blood of Jesus. No, 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 no. When the devil attacks, stand up and say, the blood speaks on my behalf. Hey. For the blood is speaking. Because the high priest, when he ascended from the grave, Mary Magdalene came to touch me, saying, No, touch me not. I have not appeared before the Father. And when he appeared, the Bible said, He entered the Holy of Holies in the heights of the heavens and he sprinkled the blood on your account. So the blood is speaking for you perpetually. So I don't need to say, I sprinkle the blood before the magic happens. When I show up, I know the blood is already being sprinkled. Because if I walk in the light, if I walk in the revelation, if I walk in the understanding, then the blood is already walking. Jesus is the administrator of the blood and the blood is speaking for you now. See, it's because the blood is sprinkled. That's why you can ask God for forgiveness in the first place. Who told you you, you can be forgiven? There's no forgiveness in anybody. Forgiveness is only in Jesus. It's in Jesus that you and I have forgiveness. 
and it's because the blood is being sprinkled that's why you have forgiveness when you go to God and say Lord I'm sorry you think it's your kneeling down that will pay for your immorality do you know what happened when you fornicated do you know the princes in darkness that you gave access to you don't even understand what what happens organically for sins to be forgiven for sins to be forgiven the son of God had to die he had to be put to shame when Jesus was hanging on the cross he was not wearing boxers he was naked that is God humiliated among men. So you think because you came and cried, oh, the Lord, have mercy. Ah, ah, you are forgiven. You are a funny man. When we go to ask for forgiveness, we are doing that with assurance that the blood is speaking. The blood is the basis for your asking for forgiveness. And that's why in this kingdom, the Bible says there is nothing you can boast about. Everything you are will ever be and can ever be is based on what Jesus did. There's no room for posting. The man who is standing is not standing because he's strong, he's standing because the Holy Ghost is at work in him. The blood is what cleanses you from sin. If you are righteous, it's because the blood is speaking, not just because you have the nature of God. The blood is constantly being furnished in your direction. What the Bible calls forgiveness is not pardon, God doesn't know how to pardon. You can insult me. And I say, okay, don't worry. I've pardoned you. God don't know how to do that. God doesn't pardon. <laughs> I know some people are hearing it for the first time. Spirits don't pardon. If the offense is there, you must be punished. Because spirits are just. They are just beings. And they walk in the realm of the spirit, which is a legal system. There is nothing like pardon. The word used for, as forgiveness in the New Testament is the word aphesis. In the Greek, it means to be blotted out. The reason God forgave you is because your sins was washed. So even God himself, when he checks, he won't see it. If God sees your sin, you'll be punished. If God looks at you and he sees your sin, you'll be punished. The reason God forgives you is because when he checks you and scrutinizes you, he can't see your sin. The blood will wash it off. That's why he said your sins were blotted out. If there's no economy of the blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. The Bible said, without the blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. If your sins are not washed us, God, God can pardon you. So the reason we ask for forgiveness in the first place is because the blood is speaking. The thing was washed off. And there is a technology in God that is so strange. You know, God dwells in eternity. Eternity means, it doesn't really mean beyond time. It means outside of time. So God can still enter your yesterday and be relating with you as if yesterday is today. He can enter into your future now that you are here. And God will interact with you in the future and go back to heaven. When you, you arrive at the future, then you start talking to God. You say, I have an encounter. No, that encounter was there since the foundation of the world. <laughs> it's the dynamics of spirit life. See, the encounter you will have tomorrow is already in tomorrow. Because God doesn't work by time. And the same way, when God forgives you your sins, He entered your yesterday and deleted it. He entered your day before yesterday and deleted it. So you yourself, if you go back to yesterday, you will not find your sins. It's not there. It's the technology of the blood. It blocks out your sins. That's why God can forgive you. Because the sin is no longer there. And that is why every time we look at Jesus, we say thank you. There is nothing we can tell him but thank you. Because we did nothing. We don't deserve it. It's mercy. I just want to be where you are. In your presence. That's why the presence of God is the only place to be. That's the only place to be and have meaning. I just want to be where you are In your dwelling place forever Take me through the place where you are I just want See, if you understand the gospel, right? 
you will become very, very reasonable. And you will become very, very grateful. Do you know why sometimes we are arrogant around God? We don't have understanding of what He did for us. The same way the blood spoke for your sins yesterday and day before yesterday, the blood is already speaking about your sins in the future. So when you enter the future, you enter with gratitude. You say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So you knew I will mess up and you are still using me. Do you know as we are moving in the anointing now, we may sin tomorrow. God knows that we will sin tomorrow. There are some prophets that minister powerfully in the anointing. One month later, two months later, they fell into fornication. When they were moving the anointing, God was already aware they would fall into fornication. How did God still allow them to move in power? It's the mystery of the blood. Because the blood is already there. That time you are asking for forgiveness, the blood is already there. That's why we are so grateful. When people begin to grow in God, right? When you come to look, hear their prayers, they don't have many things to say. Sometimes a man kneels down for four hours and he says, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Sometimes he lays down and he says, Lord, have mercy. Have mercy. Have mercy. Why can you use a man like me? Have mercy. That man has grown. But when you see a young believer, he will stand and say, Him that dwells in the right hand of Zion, Him that moved by the powers of the consolation, He that has a stalking grammar, He thinks his grammar. But the elders, they have seen the sacrifice. They understand the weight of the sacrifice. So when they show up, they say, have mercy. Have mercy. Have mercy. The blood is the last card. <laughs> you are justified because of the blood. Never allow the devil come to put you in bondage anymore. The reason you will not sin is not because you now discover you are forgiven, so you do what you want. The reason you will not sin is because the love of God constrains you. Now you have known the love of God. The love of God constrains you. Listen, some preachers come and say, if you tell people this kind of thing, they will continue in sin. It's a lie. They gave them over 600 laws in the Old Testament. They were even killing some. They were stoning people to death. People were still sinning. Fear does not stop you from sinning. Fear will only torment you. The Bible says fear brings a torment. What will set you free from sin is the love of God. Paul said the love of God constrains us. He constrains us. Because we understand, we understand, we understand that there was one that has borne our sins. The reason most Christians are not grateful is because they don't understand the depth of the work of Jesus. If a man shows you mercy, you can never offend him. Even in the natural, you understand better. You don't have school fees. They were driving you from school. And somebody pays your school fees forever. You'll be indebted. It's called the love of God. And it's the mystery of the blood. That's what silences Satan. If Satan knows that you understand that the blood is speaking for you, he will not come troubling you with depression anymore. I don't know what will happen to me to be depressed. I can never be depressed. I can never. And I'm telling you, I've seen terrible things. I have seen terrible things. I can never be depressed. I was in 300 level in 2009 when my mom died. I woke up in the morning. They told me my heart broke apart. But I got up. I said, thank you, Lord. You know better. This is not what I desire. But I know at the end, you have a better answer. And I went and wrote my exam that day. Some years ago, my other brother died. I had an impartation service the next day. I went to the impartation service. I was crying, but I was ministering. The power of God. I can't be depressed. I was serving in worry in 2013. The day I entered that book, I was in Kano first, but I had to go to worry. So many stories. The day I entered, I was going to worry in Agbo. Armed robbers robbed people just before our car came. Oh! And I was like, I've entered a jungle. I entered that day to get my place of primary assignment. And while I moved around, I didn't get a place that day. I had to return to Asaba. I checked my pocket. There was 20 naira. I had exhausted all my money. Wow. I began to speak in tongues. I carried my phone to call my friend. Battery. Bong, 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 battery. Phone went off. And I just saw a robbery. 
and I don't have any place to stay in worry. I began to speak in tongues and headed towards the ATM. God, you will either answer today or me and you will die. If what they say about speaking in tongue is true, it will prove itself today. Because if this tongue cannot deliver me, I will not speak it when I see a demon. Shatata, barakata. I entered the ATM. I slotted my, my ATM and I withdrew 5,000. Meanwhile, there was no cobo there. Shatata, elakataya. Oh, if you don't learn these things, you will try to understand it in the day of trouble, but that day there will be anxiety. That's why it's better to learn it when you are at peace. The day trouble comes, you are already a master. You are not going to entire and error. You are a master. Many people pray in tongues when their wives are in the labor room. No, no, no. You had nine months of prayer. <laughs> When things don't happen, they don't come and say, Oh God, why? Oh God, why? You are a foolish man. The Bible said the labor of the foolish weary at every one of them because they know not how to enter the city. There is a technology of apprehending things in God. Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 15. And it doesn't stop there. In verse 16 and 17, he said, Woe unto the land whose king is a child and whose prince is eat for pleasure. He said, but blessed is the land whose king is the son of the noble and whose princes eat for strength and not for drunkenness. When you come into understanding, you take responsibilities. We don't live our life by chance. We take responsibility. When I knew that scripture, I don't eat breakfast. I, I pray tongues and I, I say no. Even if it's even if I'm wrong, I will apply this one literally. You take responsibility for your life and for everybody around you. Woe, woe unto the land whose king is a child. Many people are babes. That's why the devil torments them. You eat these things, you internalize them, you persuade yourself, you are convinced by it. The day trouble comes, you will stand and say, hey, what are you doing? Bishop Oedipo was in the hotel and thieves came robbing. And then he came down with his nightgown. And they said, hey, come on, what are you doing there? And the people that had gone began to run. Say, hey, fire, fire. <laughs> That's the extent to which he understands it. That's the extent to which he understands it. They asked John Trillick, how can you carry viruses in your hand that you are not affected? He said, my soul is exercised in eternal life. You trade with these things every day. They look very simple, but they are your insurance in life. You eat it every day. You hear it every day. You study it every day until without thinking becomes a natural flow. People want to hear about patterns, about dimensions, about the angelic realm, but they don't apply that any day of their life. The basic things they apply, they don't want to hear it. It's too simple for them. That's why many are in trouble. Did you not notice these places where they teach redemptive reality that they see the greatest miracles? All the places where they talk about spiritual ranking and patterns and pathways. In a conference of seven days, only one deaf ear will be open. But the guy who is talking about the love of God, the mercy of God, if he begins to move, people are standing up in their numbers. These are the things that make the difference in life. Hallelujah. <laughs> the mystery of the blood is an insurance policy of heaven. And thirdly, it's called the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus is higher than all the names. Alpha and Omega. There is no other name like him. The name of Jesus is higher than all the names. King of all peace. No other name like him. The name of Jesus is higher than all the names. Alpha and Omega, no other name like Him. The name of Jesus is higher than all the names. 
That song will be our activator of the miracle power. Wait more. The window has not opened. The name of Jesus. Many people don't understand what the name of Jesus is. So they are in a vehicle. And then the driver just breaks with full force. Jesus, 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 Jesus. They just profess their fear. They are calling Jesus, but what went up in the spirit realm is fear. And it's a dark cloud. You know, the economy of language in the spirit is different from the natural. Even your thoughts make statements in the spirit realm. What left you is fear. And the demons will know that, oh, this guy is afraid. Thank God. <laughs> they know what to do. If you know the name of Jesus, you are a conqueror in life. You know, I'm trying to watch my time. You know, today, today, I'm not talking about transformations. I'm keeping it calm. So that you will know it's God that does these things. It's not the man. Most times when I share the gospel, I try to make people look away from the man. To look at Jesus. You know, nowadays, there are many ways men of God package themselves. The guy enters the hall and is quiet. He just said that is. He's connected to heaven. That time his, his angels are talking to him. We never come close to him. He doesn't relate with anybody in close proximity. Even if you are in the same house, you can't talk to a man of God. But Jesus was cropping into the bush with his disciples, yet miracles were happening. There's a place for discipline. There's a place for order. But it should not become a show. It should not become a thing of pride. Because most of you here who are young ministers, very soon you will begin to preach. Let it not enter your head that you are something. If not, you will turn people from Jesus to you. So you go for meetings. People are running to touch the shoe of the man to talk. But the Holy Ghost has been crying every morning for them to come into his presence. They don't come. But the man of God show up. They are, they are, so they want to touch the button of his shirt. If you will clamor around the Holy Ghost like that for two weeks, your life will change. If you will hunger to touch Jesus like that for one week, you will be a changed man. And we don't learn. You do that with all the big men of God you knew, your life is still where it is. And we don't learn. When you read the Bible, try to follow it carefully. People live with Apostle Paul. And Paul was telling them to pray in tongues and fan to flame what they have received. Now, if you have a vision with, of Paul, you will say you are, you, are, you are a Colossus. You say, it's Paul that appeared to me. Paul, Paul. Meanwhile, the Timothy that live with Paul every day, he say, make sure you fan to flame the gift of God that is in him. He pointed Timothy to the precepts and the principles of the kingdom. Because he was not the thing happening. Jesus is the reigning king. The name of Jesus. The name of Jesus is the seal of authority in the spirit realm. In the spirit realm, names are not primarily for nomenclature. Names are signatures of authority. If you read the Old Testament, every time God demonstrated a feat of his power, that encounter is trapped in the name. Because names are carriers of the full essence of a spirit reality. When God showed up and met the needs of Adam, he called him the El Shaddai. So that his generations after him, if they can invoke the name of the El Shaddai, the same encounter that he had, they too will walk in it. That was why Abraham walked with the El Shaddai. Isaac walked with the El Shaddai. Jacob walked with the El Shaddai. Because the fullness of the reality of God as El Shaddai is trapped in the name. When you can apprehend the name of a spirit, you have the full authority of that spirit. They are encapsulators of the essence of spirit beings. 
That's why the children of Israel called God names. They wanted to trap and immortalize their encounters. So anyone that shows up after 50 years, if things go wrong, he will call upon the name of that God and the dimensions of that God will manifest. When we call the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus is the fullness of all of the totality of the Godhead put together. The Bible said in Colossians chapter 2 verse 9, they said it pleased the Father that the fullness of the Godhead should dwell in him bodily. So when you invoke the name of Jesus, you are invoking the powers of the Godhead. With the name of Jesus, you don't need to call El Shaddai, you don't need to call El Elyon, you don't need to call Jehovah Sabaoth. When you call Jesus, the fullness of God comes to manifestation. It is the seal of authority that we have in the heavens. That name was not available among men. Men had no authority to use that name. For men to use that name, Jesus had to become a man and pay the demands of justice of the Father before that name was available for men. In Philippians 2, verse 5 to 9, after Jesus did all that he did, the Bible said, and God exalted him and gave him a name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, both in heaven, on earth, and in the world beneath, and every tongue confess that Jesus is the Lord. So what God added to the name of Jesus for man to use is the Lord. So every time you invoke the name of Jesus, you become Lord over circumstances. When he was born, his name was God Jesus. But Lord was not part of Jesus when he was born. Lord became part of Jesus when the sacrifice was complete. So if you call the name of Jesus, you become Lord over principalities and powers. You become Lord over demons. You become Lord over sicknesses and diseases. It is the greatest seal of authority that we have on earth. So anytime you call that name, never call it in fear. Because the name of Jesus is significant of lordship. Lordship. When you say Jesus, what you are doing is that you are proclaiming yourself to be above the circumstance. That's why when we see the sick, we say Jesus. When we see the demon possessed, we say Jesus. Because in Jesus, we proclaim lordship. And it was available to you on the strength of the sacrifice. These are insurance policies that God put in place for your victory in life. Doesn't this God care so much? God knew you were going to sin sometimes tomorrow, so he put the blood. God knew you were going to be condemned in eternity, so he put the cross. God knew you were going to have crises and challenges, so he put the name. What a loving father. If you understand the love of God, your life will change. Higher than all the name, Alpha and Omega, no other name like him. The name of Jesus is higher than all the name, King of all kings, no other name like him. The last thing I want to share with us this evening is called the mercy of God. You see, these other things I have revealed, you need to know them and walk in them for them to work for you. But when we talk about the economy of mercy, it's when God go out of his way to reach out to you. You know, salvation, there was no covenant upon which salvation could be prosecuted. The reason God stepped out to provide grace and love was because of mercy. Mercy is what makes God to go out of his way to reach you. The covenants that you invoke and are put in place, they were there because God had mercy for you. The Bible said as a father pitieth his son. As a father pitieth his son. That is what God sees towards you. So the times when you didn't know the revelation of the name of Jesus to invoke it, there was something working called mercy. The time when you didn't know about the love of God, there was something working is called mercy. In Lamentations chapter 3 verse 22, the Bible said, for his mercy we are not consumed. 
Many times we don't know the resources to use, but there is something at work. The reason you went for that interview and you passed, favor spoke for you even though you didn't prepare for it, was because there is an economy called mercy. The mercy of God is superior to covenant because covenants are born because of mercy. Mercy is the platform that covenant rests upon. If you know God is merciful towards you, every day of your life you'll be confident. And every day of your life you'll be full of gratitude. Because even the places where we lack understanding. You know the Bible said my people perish for the lack of knowledge. Have you noticed there are many areas where you lack understanding yet you are still alive? It is the mercy of God that speaks. It's the mercy of God. These are insurance policies. I don't have time anymore to expo expound on things. That's why I'm speeding up. But we are going to pray for the sick now. We are going to pray for the sick now. Can you lift your hands toward heaven and worship God? The name of Jesus Higher than all the names Alpha and Omega No other no, name no, no. like you hey, 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 hey. Exalt his name. Give him praise for what he will do tonight. The name of Jesus. Worship him tonight. Exalt his name. Give him praise. No other name like you. Kidney infections, liver infections, hepatitis, kidney stone, every kind of organ infection, heart infections, lung infections. Right now, you devil of darkness, I charge you out of them. Every bone infection, dislocations, bone disorders, hear the word of the Lord. I charge you, lose your grip over them in the name of Jesus. Every irregular growth in your body, lumps in the breast, growth in the armpit, growth on every part of the body that is irregular in the name of Jesus, I command you, dissolve. Let every form of chain, mental chains, that cause retardation in understanding, that cause lukewarmness, backwardness, depression, you devil, what are you waiting for? Out in the name of Jesus. Come on. We are going to dance now. And as we begin to dance, you will discover something strange has happened. People with ear issues will discover it's opening. Growth will be vanishing. Eye infections. You are using glasses. Remove it and check. You will be amazed. Where is the lead? Where is the lead? Hallelujah. Eh. Hey. Hallelujah. Oh. Hey. Hallelujah. Oh. It's a sound of victory. Sound of victory. Hallelujah. Hey. Hallelujah. Hey. Hallelujah. Oh. Shame on Satan. You have somebody, a relative who is sick. You have the picture lifted now. 
You can call the person, call now. We are about to send the healing power of God to your houses. Everybody connected to a sick person here. Everybody connected to a sick person. I come by the rod of a higher priesthood and I command the sickness bow to the name of Jesus. Bow to the name of Jesus. Ulcers, cancers, bone infection, liver infection, kidney infection, lung infection, blinding devils, deafening spirits. I command you bow to the name of Jesus. Bow to the name of Jesus. Let there be healing right now. Everybody you are connected to right now, the power of God goes. The power of God goes to heal and to deliver. Right now. Right now. Right now. In the name of Jesus. Go ahead and call your relatives and find out. Come on, give me some. Hallelujah. Eh. Hallelujah. Oh. Eh. Hallelujah. Eh. It's the sound of victory. Hey, hallelujah. Hey, hallelujah. Oh, let the sound of rejoicing fill. Hallelujah. Hey, hallelujah. Hey, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hey, hallelujah. Hey, it's the sound of victory. Hey, hallelujah. Hey. Listen, we don't have time. In the next two minutes, as we've seen, you've checked your body, something has happened, pain has departed. You can see where something has happened. Just come to the front very quickly. We'll take those two testimonies and then we'll flow because we have other activities. Let the sound sing. Let the sound of rejoicing. Hey, he has made a way. He has made a way. Where there is no way. Hallelujah. Hey, hey, it's the sound of healing. Hallelujah. Hey, hallelujah. Hey, let the sound. Receive your healing by standing. Check your healing. Growths in the body have vanished. Sicknesses have left. Check your body. You discover you are healed. Come to the front now. Let's take testimony and give all the glory to Jesus. He's the healer tonight. Come on. Let's hear what God has done for us. Somebody, somebody, can, can a pastor just come and help us quick? So that we don't take time. We don't want long story. I was blind. I can see. So let the pastor give us some time. Praise the Lord. Yesterday when the man of God was preaching, the first thing he said, when he came out, she just prayed to God, asked God for something. And what was in my mind was like, my mother, that was the first thing that came to my mind. She has been sick for three years. For three years. And I prayed yesterday. I cried out to God that God, please, just heal her for me. And yesterday, after the service in the evening, she just called me. 
and I think I was not able to pick the girl during the service. Then I called her back. She was like, okay, I just said I should greet you. I'm fine now. I can walk now. You are like, oh, oh, oh. You are just a You are not just a You see how pain in your body? What is he waiting for? I command every pain. I command every devil spirit. I command every blinding demon. I command every growth in the breast, in the belly, in the leg. Out in the name of Jesus. People at home getting you. Your mom couldn't walk. You said your mom couldn't walk. She had been sick and she couldn't walk. No, she can walk, but she can't walk very well. She don't. She can't do anything. And now she's strong. Yes, she's hey, strong. Hey, Lahati. Yes. She went to the hospital. She went to the hospital. Sorry. She went to the hospital. Let's hear. Let's hear her. She went to the hospital at first before. The doctor couldn't find what was wrong with that. They don't have any name to give what was He's wrong with a demon. That. The I name is called the demon of infirmity. A demon of infirmity. Come on, give the Lord a big shout of praise. What happened? What happened? Give her the mic. Wait, wait. She says she's not done yet. Can we hear you please? I want to thank God for my life because I have an abnormal growth. At my chest, like the middle of my chest, like there is this pain. It comes. It was not there before, but all of a sudden it comes. I will pray it will go. I will use another thing. It will go later. It will come again. I'm like, God, what, is what has Jesus done now? Nah. I pray that God, if truly you are God, if truly, truly you know you are God, this thing must go. It must go. Ah, and I thank God it has gone. I don't feel it here anymore. Hey. And I know it's happening. She had a pain in the chest. Caused by an abnormal growth. The pain is gone. The pain is gone. We go to hell. Tell your name. Tell my name. If he likes, let him frustrate the sound. We are having a ride in glory. What happened, sister? I don't even know how to thank God, but I just want to thank Him. My father has been diabetic for six years. Her father has been diabetic for six years. What happened, sister? His blood sugar has been regulated since yesterday. There has no issue. Since of yesterday, the blood sugar has restored to normal. Kabiosi. We call that digital miracle. Are you done or you have another one? She's trying to catch her breath. Come on, somebody say, Jesus, we are juggling. We are juggling. We have not started running. We are just juggling. Tell us, sister, what happened? He also has issues with high BP. I didn't know that. He has issues with high blood pressure. He also has issues with high BP. So when he said there will be a healing service, I called him when I was coming. You called him because we said it was a healing service. When I was coming. I told you about the law of expectation. What happened? So I had enough. I supposedly reached because of this service. And I kept him on call throughout the service. And when he said we should call, I called and they checked his blood his high blood Wait, pressure. Wait, you just went out now and called? They checked his blood pressure immediately and it was normal for the first time in two years. 
آب آب بوی آب آیش کم کابی آس آب آب بوی آب آیش کابی آس Listen, she just went out now and called her father. And high BP went down for the first time in two years. Who did this? Are you done? What happened, sister? From yesterday, I was having a race pain, and he came. He kept on going and coming. So today, when he said we should, um, you were talking about praying about our pains and dislocations. I first felt like there's nothing wrong with me; it's just normal. So the pain came again, and I prayed about it. And when he told us to dance, I tried checking and checking, and, and the worst pain was no longer. It's gone. The worst pain is what? It's gone. Give me a song now. Why are you not inspiring? Listen, listen, listen. Let me show you. Let me teach you a secret. The Bible said the testimony of the righteous is just making wise the simple. When one is giving testimony, what happens is that the faith of another is growing. And while the testimony is going, you can be receiving your own. So don't just shout. Come on. Tell Jesus, give me my own now. <laughs> ta, 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 ta. What happened, sister? I've been sick for two and a half weeks. First time they said it was poisoning. Later I went for check up, they said it's infection. But they did not tell me what type of infection. I they said it was food poisoning. Later they now said infection. infection. So what happened? So I've been taking antibiotics. Yeah, it was not working. I could not stand like this. You so couldn't stand like this. For two and a half weeks. Two and a half weeks. Who did this? For two weeks, they said food poisoning. They said infection. She has been taking antibiotics. It wasn't working. But all of a sudden, something happened. Strength came, and the pain left, and she could stand. Somebody give the Lord a shout of praise. What happened, sister? All to bless the name of the Lord concerning my health. Um, I've had this issue for like a year plus. Whenever I'm stressed out, I have sores all over my mouth. I've gone through a series of investigations and all of that. It proved nothing. I've taken a series of medications. For how long now? A year plus. For one year plus, sores on the mouth. Yes, and I can't even, to the extent of going for a trivia test, everything was negative. Doctor could not tell me what was wrong. With me. So what I can't, happened? I can't. I can't laugh when it comes. You couldn't laugh or smile. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Listen, you didn't hear her testimony. Sauce on the mouth that was so severe she couldn't smile. But all of a sudden, everything is gone. She can't just smile, she's shouting. Come on. Anurue God. They are sufficient for God. I will do it. I will do it. I will do it. I will do it. I will do Pain on the left, right side of your stomach yeah, so I was from so, Sunday morning. Yes, I was so scared. I was like, let's not be appendix because 
My mom just did a penis operation. My elder sister did a penis operation. My nephew did a penis operation. So Satan has so, been plaguing your family with I a penis. I was so scared. But Pastor Vichy told me yesterday that I should just give him to the came to the prophets of the man of God that I should just have faith and my healing is going to come. I could not go sleep so, for some nights, but I thank God that today I can jump, I can scream. Did you hear what she just said? Her mom, listen, listen, her mom appendicitis, her sister appendicitis, and who else? Nephew appendicitis. The same pain came, she couldn't sleep, but something just happened. The pain is gone. Somebody say, Jesus the healer. Jesus the healer. What happened, brother? Praise God. There is this childhood problem I've been having. Childhood problem? Yes. How old are you now? Um, I'm 19 years old. You are 19 years old. And you had the problem from childhood. from childhood. What's the problem? The problem was a naval problem. Naval yes. problem. Yes. Help us. That it happened to me to the extent that sometimes I can't even use my mouth. Because it was trying to turn into an imbecile something. Then, to the extent that I started growing, because of that, it always affected my mouth. You started growing what? I started, it started affecting my mouth. Okay. That it started uh, tearing my mouth. That sometimes I would start having big wounds inside my mouth. And then... What did God do now? What did God do? He saved me. After money has been wasted in it, because... I went to a Memphis hospital and they said it was that something about my brain that brain trying to shut down. Your brain trying to shut down. Yes. This doctor sometimes is like demons used to inspire them. How can you tell somebody your brain is trying to shut down? I used to have big injuries in your mouth. You used to have big injuries in your mouth. So what happened? What happened? Now I can believe that today I can still stand on my own because it's no longer affecting me on the normal. Everything is gone. Everything is gone. Hear what Jesus just told him this evening. He said, You are healed. You are healed, brother. You are healed, brother. And he can use his mouth. Somebody give the Lord a shout of praise. Let's take this last one. Let's take this last one. We must take your own. Come this way, come this way. The mic, the speaker is interrupting us. Quick, quick, quick. Let's hear your testimony. What did God do for you, brother? Um, first of all, I'd like to thank God for my life. First yeah, of all, thanking God with you. What did God do now? Um, my mother, I, I would like to thank God for my family as well. But most especially, we thank God especially. for your family. What did Jesus do now? Most especially, my mom has been having this um, hand pain. Your you know? mom has been having hand pain? Yes. But before I came here, she gave me a phone call and said, everything is over. Can you imagine? Hallelujah. Okay, for some for some weeks now. For some weeks now I've been having pain because of stress. I know it was as a result of stress, but when I wake up in the morning and I go about my normal activities, everything will be fine. But it was not leading to sickness. But when I wake up, I consider my normal activities, it will be fine. I'll go back to sleep, I'll feel the pain. Last week, entering this week, became worse. But it was just normal then. I came to church this evening, still feeling pains all over my back, my shoulder. But while worshipping and praying, and as we were praying, I just felt this body just lifted. And right now, I feel no pain anymore. Listen, listen. The healing 
anointing is about to rest on somebody's hand. Don't try to, don't try to make it happen. Just lift your hands toward heaven. Let's have it calm now. Jesus wants to equip people now. So that many healers will be living on this campus. It will not be testimonies you have after programs. Just whisper to the Lord that I'm ready. I will answer the distress call. Even if they have to call me by night, I'll be there. I will be available. Jesus looks for available verses. Tell him now. Tell him now. Tell him now. of their feet. All shall say just help them but let's keep it calm from the crown of their heads to the soles of their feet. Holy Ghost! Prove on them now. Anoint them, anoint them, anoint them. Men walking with the healing power fighting and shutting down installations of darkness ending the plague and the reign of Satan in the borders of their habitation. Men that will stand as witnesses. Anoint now. Let the oil of healing rest on their hands tangibly. The oil. The oil. The healing mantle. The healing anointing. The faith for healing. The spirit of healing. Receive now. Receive now. You are Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Are you ready to receive from the Lord tonight? Glory to Jesus. Such a great honor to be here this evening to share with us the word of God. I want to appreciate the leadership of the Scripture Union here in Bayesa State for having us. Like you said, we were on the road from morning over 12 hours to be here this evening. I came with my brother, Pastor Victor Ogbe. I trust that the Lord, the Lord will do us real good this morning. You are tired, you are exhausted, but don't bother. Just yield to the Holy Spirit. There are different energy levels in walking with the Spirit of God. Most times when you are exhausted in the natural, that's when you, you, yield, you yield to the Holy Spirit. So you are tired, you are exhausted. Why not try out another energy level? 
<laughs> Hallelujah. Just lift your hands toward heaven and worship the Lord. Thank you, Father. The hour has come. Where we look up to you, O ancient monarch of Zion. And we cry to you this morning that you will pour upon us, Lord, your bounties. So that our infirmities will be swallowed up. Even as we look up to you, Lord, we trust that we will be transformed from glory to glory. Precious Father, cause us to walk into depths in the spirit. Where the true essence of our realities will begin to find expression. That place in the spirit where every one of us sees you as you are. And you interact with us with the peculiarities that you fashioned into us when you designed us. So that every one of us will become relevant even in the course of advancing your kingdom in this realm. Thank you Holy Spirit. We give you praise, we give you glory. Thank you Father. Just whisper something to the Lord now from the depth of your heart before we sit down in the next moment to receive the word of God. Our brother was leading the prayer and his emphasis was on expectation. It's a law in the spirit. The Bible said without every contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. But the blessings of God are predicated on the nature of expectations that we have. He said, your expectations shall not be cut short. Do you have an expectation this morning? Or is just another vigil as usual? If you have an expectation, give it expression. Vocalize your expectations. And ask the Lord to visit you this night. Ask the Lord to visit you this morning. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. We give you glory. Um, we share the word of the Lord briefly before we begin to pray. My brother and friend, Pastor Emmanuel, thank you for having me. The Lord is going to be blessing us this morning. Hallelujah. This morning, we are going to consider a topic for the next one hour. I'll just open scriptures before we begin to pray. This is scripture union, so we are a people of scriptures. Hallelujah. We are talking about a supernatural kind of service. My team scripture is Acts chapter 1 verse 8. The Bible said, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the world. It's a kind of service that we have been invited into to provide witness to the person, the life of Jesus Christ. There are many things that we can do because we have natural abilities to do them. There are many things that we can carry out even in the house of God because we sustain the natural ability to do them. Just give me floating sound on the keyboard. But for service to be consistent with the standard of heaven, there must be a supernatural element that facilitates that operation in your life. It doesn't take anything for me to talk. Because as a human being, it's natural for me to talk. So the same way I talk about a footballer, it's possible for me to come and talk about Jesus. Because I'm a human being and I can talk. And if I know anything about Jesus at all, I will talk about Jesus. But the systems of the spirit is not designed that way. 
before you carry out a service to satisfy the standard of immortal spirit those spirit themselves must give you the capacity to render such services before you can pass their scales and that is why talking and witnessing for Jesus are two different things the content may be the same but the spirit that powers the utterance is what makes the difference I could come and tell you Jesus love you because I heard about the love of God and somebody else may come to you and say Jesus loves you because that utterance was inspired by the Holy Spirit the first may be a news that is coming to you the second will come with the spirit life and that second word as simple as it sounds may have the ability to change your life forever the difference is predicated upon the element of the spirit that is communicated in your word and so when we talk about service in the house of God we talk about service enabled by supernatural elements and that is what the emphasis of the scripture in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 is all about you could be singing here because you have a good voice and because you have a good voice you sing and people enjoy it so much because you have a good voice and then you have an advantage of musical instrumentalists to give support and harmony to your voice and people will be blessed but if the veils of the supernatural are opened you may realize that what God has planted in you that you give expression through your voice is not just designed to make people feel excited in the church service on the strength of the supernatural element that is imputed in your voice maybe consistent with the ordination of God for your life is that whenever you sing there should be an impartation of the spirit to the people that hear you it could be that whenever you sing gifts of the spirit should be activated so for you singing is not about blessing people in the service every time you are on the microphone god is out to activate spiritual gifts so people may come for a service and because they sat under your ministration the healing anointing is activated in their lives you may sing all your life but you may never touch your ordination because for you singing is not a melody you are making because you have a good voice for you singing is an institution that the Lord has weaved through your voice so that through you God can carry out activity among humankind the day you begin to sing by the help of the Holy Spirit and gifts of the Spirit begins to activate in the life of people that is when your singing will amount to anything special in the corridor of God but if you judge what you do in the natural you may sing and become famous and popular but the Spirit that takes the score for what you do may not give you any grade in eternity and then you will show up in eternity at the end of time and realize you sang and became a popular vocalist that is known all around the region but in heaven you will not be popular among the immortals the difference is because you were rendering a spiritual service by natural abilities the bible said how be it they say when the spirit of truth is come there is something that is supposed to begin to happen in your life because you have received of the Holy Spirit. That is when you gravitate from natural ability to supernatural ability. But Christianity has been reduced to a set of religious cliches and instruction. So people gain mastery of supernatural things working out in natural elements. And that is why our Christianity does not have the power to challenge darkness. He said, when you receive the Holy Ghost, you will receive an ability. The word power in that scripture is the word dynamis. But dynamis is not just an ability you have on your inside. Dynamis in this context, as touching the service of God, is the enablement of the Spirit. There are many that have the Holy Ghost, but they don't have the enablement of the Spirit. You were reading the scripture about the woman with the issue of blood. The Bible says virtue went out of him. The word virtue used in that scripture is the word dynamis. In Luke chapter 6 verse 19, the Bible said, Everybody sought to touch him. He said, and as they touched him, 
virtue went out of him and healed them all. You could do everything you do in the natural, but when it comes to the service of God, it must be by the ability of the Holy Spirit. Jesus had this understanding. So there was a way he patterned his life to make sure he come to that place where the ability of God begins to find expression through him. Are you the preacher that you think opening scripture is a function of intelligence and then you are a master of exegesis? So you preach and then because your utterance sounds intelligent, you think you have fulfilled the quarter of the supernatural. If you check with heaven, you'll be amazed. Because if that ability of God does not move from within you to the people, the people may be excited because they are emotional beings. But on the scale of the divine, you may not be doing what is in the heart of the Father. Tonight we are looking at a service that comes from the womb of the Spirit. This is where we become humble. Because an orator may be in church, but he will not be qualified to preach the gospel. Because he will realize for the first time that preaching the gospel is not a function of oratory. The gospel is a witness. A man comes to a point where his life becomes a theater through which you can look and perceive the dimensions of God. It has nothing to do with oratorial power. It is an utterance of the spirit. So the man depends on God because he knows that his intelligence does not contribute to the quota in these matters. These matters, only the immortal sustain the capacity to open the gate for you. So every time you come to preach, even though you are very intelligent with scripture, you wait on the Lord crying because you know you need to be helped. It's a kind of service that is not available to humankind. Only the Spirit of God enables men to do it. What service are you rendering in the house of God? You see, the reason people become so proud about what they do in the house of God because they do it on the strength of their natural abilities. Anything you do by the ability of the Holy Ghost, you die doing it. Every time you are granted, every day I come to preach, I come trembling. Because most of the times, even the message is given to me while I'm standing on the altar. Because I know what I know in my head cannot change the life of anybody. It is what the Holy Ghost is telling that person part time that has the capacity to change him. Is it good to exercise yourself in God? Yes. But for you to serve the Lord, it is the Spirit that will walk in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. It's an enablement that comes from God. And many Christians are not taught. That's why you can leave Facebook and jump to the pulpit and begin to preach because you think it's a function of intelligence. That's why you can leave the market and you jump. I'm late for church. You carry the mic. You begin to sing because you think there are songs you know. You don't understand what we call the ministration of the Spirit. A man comes to a point where he yields to God so that God can flow through him. It's a kind of service that is lacking today in the body of Christ. There are things we must do to come to that point where the power and the ability of the Holy Ghost can flow through us. That is what I will show you from Scripture this evening. So you know how men serve God supernaturally. In Acts chapter 6, the Bible said from verse 3, it said when the company of the people became large, crisis began to come in. The, the apostles needed to set two challenges. And they said it's not good for us to leave the matters of the spirit and give ourselves to tables. He said, select from among you men of good report, full of the Holy Ghost. He said, let them attend to these matters. He said, but we, we will give ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the world. And in verse 5, the Bible said, they selected seven men of honest report. And when they came to Stephen, they said, Stephen, was full of the Holy Ghost and faith. Full of the Holy Ghost and faith, Stephen was qualified to serve tables. But the point came where God needed Stephen to do something that was beyond his natural abilities. Serving tables he could do by being a man full of the Holy Ghost and faith. But there is another level of service that you have to contain something that is virtue. You need to abstract virtue from the Holy Ghost to carry out that one. And in verse 8, the Bible said, Stephen, full of the Holy Ghost and power. At this time, 
the Holy Ghost that stood in her, something had happened to it. The Holy Ghost had become a virtue that could flow through Stephen. And he said, Stephen began to do the same thing that the apostles were doing. What happened to Stephen? The Holy Ghost had become power. There are many Christians that are full of the Holy Ghost today, but the power dimension of the Holy Ghost is not at work. And when I talk power, I'm not talking about you come from meeting and people are falling down. No, 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 no. I'm talking about doing the assignment of God for your life by the abilities of God. Men may not even see it tangibly, but what you are doing, there will be a supernatural dimension to it that makes what you are doing to produce results that only God can produce. If you have not come to that point, then witnessing is not a part of your life. It doesn't matter how long you have been in church. At the age of 17, Timothy was ordaining elders. Because this is a service that comes from the realm of the divine. People are not taught the ways of God. We live our lives the way we wish. And then we think the same ability we use to relate with men is the same ability we use to relate with spirit. It doesn't work like that. I can meet my brother and treat with him as a man. But when I want to speak for a spirit, I need to be enabled. Because I'm shifting dimensions. And most of you here that have the witness that God wants to use you, you need to subscribe to the protocol that I'm about to reveal to you. Because whether your work with God will count, will depend on the degree to which God can flow through you. Not the degree to which you know about God. Paul said we know God. He said, but more importantly, we are known of God. He has come to a point where his legal intelligence was no longer relevant. This guy was trained by the best in his day. But when he encountered God, the Bible said, he went to the wilderness of Arabia. And as he returned from there, he said, when he pleased the Father to reveal the Son in me. So what Paul was teaching, he was not teaching it because he studied the Torah. Paul was teaching because the Father revealed the Son in him. So he was communicating the revealed Christ that God gave to him. That was why Paul was the only one that could bring the dimensions of the church to bear. The apostles did not understand it. Even when they gathered in the Jerusalem council, after the Holy Ghost came, after Cornelius was baptized, they were still troubling Peter. How dare you enter the family of the Gentiles? What did you mean to with these people? They had no understanding because they were still trying to brainstorm on supernatural possibilities. And he said, no, 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 no. Peter lived with them for many years. Even when he went to Antioch, he was eating with the Gentiles. And people came from Jerusalem and Peter hid himself. Because they had no revelation. But there was a man who entered the wilderness. And God revealed Jesus to him. And Paul began to talk about mysteries that were hid before the foundations of the world. How did he know these things? There was something at work in him. I want to show you something this morning that will make you understand that Christianity is beyond puppet. Because I know many young people that think it's about microphone. Jesus did not do Christian. Do, he did not carry out service so much in the synagogue. Most of the things he did, he did in the market. He did in the schools. Because when the supernatural flows through you, you don't need a corporate gathering to express God. Everywhere you stand, you become a pillar and a witness to the existence of God. Many people are not witnesses. We are churchgoers. We are religious people. So when we gather among ourselves, we show things that we have learned. Things that we have mastered in our senses. But if we are in the market, we cannot prove Jesus. If we are in the school, we cannot prove Jesus. If we are in the offices, we cannot prove Jesus. That's because the supernatural dimension is not there. When you come to church, you can tell people to praise the Lord, lift your hand, they will follow. You don't tell people that in the market. It is the supernatural that flows through you that they look out for. And that's why there are many Christians who cannot demonstrate God in their world. We are religious people, we think we are spiritual. He said, there are words apart. And as young people, for us to journey far in God and count, there are many things we need to learn. Because our world will continue to journey in darkness unless a new species of people rise. A generation has passed. God is anointing a new generation. And if we don't understand the genuineness of working with God, even this generation will be lost before we begin. Because there are a lot of garbages, arrogance, all kinds of folly demonstrated by young people. We think 
We think ministry is now a Facebook thing. So you come on Facebook, you write one funny revelation, and then you share it everywhere, and you think you are doing ministry. We don't understand that this thing is about life. What do you do to host the life of God? What do you do to be able to steward the dimensions of the Spirit? If you check yourself, you've been in church for close to 10 years, how much of God can you demonstrate? If you are the only Christian in Bayesa today, will there be a witness for Jesus? What if there is no organized church system anymore? Can you be a representative of Jesus? How much of Jesus can you demonstrate in your family? How much of Jesus can you demonstrate in your school? How much of Jesus can you demonstrate in your offices? That's the proof that there is something supernatural working at you in your life. And that's when you can begin to render service before the spirit of the mortal ones. You reign. You ancient Zion's king. Kadosh. Kadosh. You are mighty on your throne. You reign. You ancient Zion's king. Kadosh, Kadosh, you are mighty on your throne. What is working in your life that is the Holy Ghost that powers it? Is there anything you can point in your life that you know this one is the Holy Ghost that is making it work? If there is nothing like that, it means your journey is far. Your journey is far. We only brag and pride ourselves in things that form, form our natural advantage. What of your spirit? What of your spiritual advantage? Where are they? What? Where are your spiritual tools and resources? We reduce Christianity to advice, counseling, Christianity, the business of spirits. You think is at the level of advice? There's a place for advice. There's a place for counseling. But brother. If you cannot relate with the spirit that powers life, you are a joker. Do you think Jesus was holy because he, he was advised not to live carelessly? The Bible said it was the spirit of holiness that was at work in him. That's why he couldn't fall. You advise young ladies. Do you know what is happening in the campuses? There are princes that rule over those territories. That's why many virgins are disflowered before their matriculation. Because the advice fail, it fails in the presence of a spirit. So you want to secure somebody in God, teach that person the way of the spirit. Because when he enters into an atmosphere that is predominated by spirit reality, everything you talk, the person will collapse. There are spirit realities and Christians are not taught. They are not taught. We talk, that's why nowadays many young preachers are living in secret sin. Many are living in secret sin because we think being a preacher is about a show where you come to church and compose yourself so demons make a mess of people if you check the secret life of many people it stinks because we don't understand that these things are businesses of spirits we have only been invited to participate with those spirits so we must learn their ways and cooperate with their government so that they can flow through us if the Holy Ghost begins to flow through you by righteousness, it will no longer be a rule and regulation thing to live righteously. Righteous living will become your lifestyle because it will be an effulgence of the nature of the Holy Spirit. You reign, you ancient Zion skin, Kadosh, Kadosh, you are mighty on your throne. You reign, you ancient Zion king, Kadosh, Kadosh, you are mighty on your throne. Every one of us was designed for a specific assignment. Every one of us. Four of us could be prophets, but we have very definite and peculiar assignment. We are not the same. Our beauty is in our peculiarity, but our strength is in our harmony. The only way our diversity can be harmonized to build a system that represents God is when all of us begin to walk by the Spirit. Every time flesh appears, it truncates the operation of God. No matter how beautiful it looks like, 
If one person is in the flesh, they can compromise the integrity of our corporate persona. One person. Every one of us must be taught the way of the Spirit. Jesus, the Son of God, lived like that. It didn't matter if he was the world. He lived like that. There is a rigid government the Holy Ghost will bring upon your soul if you will serve him. Remember, he said you shall receive the Holy Ghost and power. Stephen was full of the Holy Ghost and faith. Stephen was full of faith and power. What happened to Stephen that the Holy Ghost became power? It's a system in the spirit. It's a system in the spirit. Jesus came to this world to be the light of the world. The reason he came was so that men who were in darkness could see light. What did Jesus do before he became light? John chapter 1 verse 1. He said, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was light. The light was the light of men. What did the word do that the word became light? Because when he came, he came as the word. A point came, he became the light. He said, they that dwelt in the shackles of death. A great light is sprung forth. What happened to the world that it became light? It is a government of the Holy Spirit. Many does not subscribe to that government. So we come to talk from our brain. We come to pray with our abilities. That's why you pray for 30 minutes, you become tired. If you pray by the strength of the Holy Ghost, the more you pray, the stronger you should become. Why? Because we are supposed to build up ourselves upon our most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. So, praying in the Holy Ghost is supposed to invigorate you. But why do you pray and you get weary? Because you are using adenosine triphosphate. And the more you use natural strength, you will deplete the starch. And when you deplete it, you will become weak. You have not learned how to pray by the strength of the Spirit. There is something you touch in God that you begin to spend from the resources of heaven. That's when your life becomes an endless beauty. There is something you touch. I want to show you what you must touch that will make you travel beyond the scriptures you have in your brain. You will begin to talk Rema because the Holy Ghost himself will be talking through you. There is something you need to touch where you will begin to spend from the economy of the divine. It's called the government of the Holy Ghost. If you don't come under the government of the Holy Ghost, your service is a waste. It's a waste. Your motivations cannot be tamed. Your convictions cannot be defined. Your essence cannot be evaluated. Because you'll be doing things based on different kinds of lust. Many things will be in error. Jesus lived for 30 years. He could not witness to anybody. He was in the synagogue at the age of 12. The Bible said he asked the doctors of the law questions and he answered them. These guys could not answer him. He asked the questions. He ended up answering them at the age of 12. So if it was about intelligence, Jesus was ready for ministry. Why did he wait for 30 years? It's a government. He said that child Jesus grew in wisdom, in stature, and in favor before God and before men. Why did he not start ministry? He knew. You know, as the word of God, there were many things Jesus could say without reading. He didn't need to read anything as the word of God. He was the Logos made flesh. So Jesus could just come and begin to talk. And everything he says will be the word of God. <laughs> just think about it for a moment. So Jesus didn't need to do anything. Just go out and begin to preach. Because he was the word of God. As the creator. Jesus could just begin to. It was possible for him to just begin to demonstrate power. And creation will bow to him. Why? Because he's the creation. He's the creator. Remember the Bible said. In the beginning was the word. He said the word was with God. And the word was God. Three credentials. One he is the word. As the word, he knew the mind of the Father. So Jesus doesn't need to read to teach. He doesn't need to read to preach. Two, he was the creator. As the creator, he had power over creation. And three, he said he was equal with God. As equal with God, it means he had a status that was beyond humankind. But why did he not begin to manifest? 
Jesus understood that for service to be recorded in heaven from the earth, it must come through the Holy Ghost. That's why everything he did, he did by the Holy Ghost. The Bible said in Acts chapter 1 verse 2, he said after he gave commandment through the Holy Spirit to his disciples. So every word Jesus was speaking for it to be recorded in eternity, it had to come from the womb of the Spirit. The Bible said he gave himself up in the Spirit. The Bible said the works that I do, it is the Father that is in me that doeth them. So everything Jesus did in time, it was through the veil of the Holy Spirit. It was from the womb of the Holy Spirit. So everything he is apart from the apart from the Holy Spirit will not count. In this realm, anything you do outside of the Holy Ghost doesn't count. Jesus knew it. That was why he had to first of all submit himself to the Holy Spirit. To the degree that even everything he said, he said through the Holy Spirit. Everything he did, he did through the Holy Ghost until even dying, he died by the Holy Spirit. Even the eternal sacrifice of his blood, the Bible said he gave it through the Holy Ghost. There was nothing Jesus did outside of the Holy Spirit because he knew, even though he was co equal with the Father, for his services to be recorded in time, it must be through the Holy Ghost. So he yielded to the government of the Holy Spirit. The first way to activate the supernatural dimension of God in your life is to come under the government of the Holy Ghost. That was why Jesus, 30 years before he began his ministry, the first place he went to was to go to Jordan. And in Matthew chapter 3 from verse 15, he went to John to be baptized. And John said, no, 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 no. This is an error. I should be baptized of you. Why? John was looking at him as what? As the world. John was looking at him as the creator. John was looking at him as being equal with God. But Jesus was teaching John and humankind something. That so long as you are in time, unless you do what the Holy Ghost intends, you will not pass the test of the mortars. So he said, suffer it to be so for now. He said, thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. So the divine standard can only be met when every being in creation come under the will of the Holy Spirit. So I'm not disputing the fact that I'm the world. I know I'm the world. You are right. I'm not disputing the fact that I'm creator. I know I'm creator. You are right. And I'm not disputing the fact that I'm co-equal with the Father. I know. He said, but for this service to be accepted in heaven, it must be consistent with the government of the Holy Spirit. How do you know it was the Holy Ghost? The moment he was baptized, he said in Matthew 4, 1, he said the Holy Ghost led him into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. So his coming to that baptismal service was the leading of the Holy Spirit. He said, come and bow, come and surrender. It is the way of death. That's when everything that makes you think you are special, you give it up willingly. So that everything that is of God can find expression through you. A man will remain proud unless he decides to put down everything he thinks is an advantage. That's where you see a man who is an orator. He comes to church and the service of God that time is for cleaner. And the orator will become a cleaner. Why? Suffer it to be so for now. This is where Christianity goes beyond doctrine into life. You know you are more cooked in scripture than everybody. But what is needed at that time is somebody that will arrange the chairs. What happened? Suffer it to be so for now. Because the church is not looking for people who are special. It's looking for people who are yielded to serve. And it is where the Holy Ghost wants you to serve part time that his government can render you. Jesus said, suffer it to be so for now. It's called the law of righteousness. Not many obey it. We come to church, we do what we want to do. You may be going to church to minister and the Holy Ghost tells you, before you minister there, pray in tongues for six hours. You can choose not to pray in tongues. You will go there and you still preach. And at least one person will be blessed. But in heaven there will be no record. Because you didn't suffer it to be so for now. You have the knowledge of the Bible in your head. But the Holy Ghost says pray for six hours. Because what the Holy Ghost wants to tell the people is at an energy level in the spirit. And until you subscribe to that prayer, you cannot download what the Holy Ghost is saying part time. So even though you have the knowledge of the scripture, what God is saying is in a place in the spirit. And until you fulfill that quota of prayer, you cannot decode what he's saying. And you can come and preach the Bible that you know, but you did not give expression to the voice of God that night. So there is no record in eternity. 
Jesus said, suffer it to be so for now. It's the first way of activating spiritual possibilities in a man. We will be full of talent. We will be full of, 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 we'll be full of gifts. But we we'll wonder why God is not on the scene. Because we are not walking through the Holy Spirit. You see the lady singing so intelligently, so beautifully. The voice is so sweet. But it cannot move the hand of the immortals. Why? Because it is not through the Holy Spirit. His flesh will die. Have you come for a meeting before where you plan to move in power? <laughs> for those of you who are preachers, you understand what I'm saying better. You have your message, you want to move in power. And then you came and when you started talking, the Holy Ghost said, no, that's not what I'm saying. And then you change your message there. And then you talk and the meeting is calm. And then the people that came to see you were disappointed because they heard that you are a man of power. But the person the Holy Ghost wants to talk to, what he needs to hear is love. So the Holy Ghost says, talk love. And then you talk love quietly and you pack your bags and go away. That day, you may not have a high score with men, but you have a high score with spirits. And that's what counts. That's what Jesus knew. When Jesus was coming before John, you remember what John said? Behold the Lamb of God. They began to read the citation. Everybody. You would imagine what everybody was doing that time. Because there was no prophet in Israel for 400 years. John was the first voice that rose in 400 years. Everybody knew that John was a prophet of God. And here comes a man. And John said, this is the Lamb of God. What? Here comes a man. And John said, this is the one I spoke about. The one in whom I said, the latchet of his sandals I'm not qualified to lose. And then this man needs to come and kneel down before John. You may not understand what it means until God begins to carry out that protocol in your life. Where you were the president for four years, and then God now comes and says, no, go and turn to cleaner. You will not understand until you come to that point where flesh needs to be crucified. That's when you understand how people beg virtue. Virtue is born when flesh dies. It says, suffer it to be so for now. We are full of flesh. That's why so much cannot happen. We even come for meeting with scatters, roar so that tears scatter, so that we can satisfy the fact that people know we have power. But we are not even conscious about what God is doing by time. Because we are full of flesh. Even when we are doing spiritual things, we cannot communicate better. Because flesh is focused. The guy comes to minister. He's not conscious of what the Holy Ghost is saying. He wants to chat everywhere up so that everybody will fall down screaming. Let them say the guy is full of power. He has satisfied his ambition. But he doesn't know that the Father has something in mind. Men that serve in the kingdom are men that die to flesh. They only look out for what is pleasing to the Father. Concerning Jesus, the Bible said in the volumes of the book, it is written of me, I come to do thy will. That's why the Son of God could die the death of a criminal. There were many times when Jesus was tempted to defend himself. But the Bible said he was quiet. Because he didn't come to give glory to himself. He came that the will of the Father would be done through him. So many times he will be quiet. There are times when things will happen. You just needed to say something and vindicate yourself. And the Holy Ghost said, keep quiet. You will be boiling inside. You will be boiling. Keep quiet. Everybody gives you a name for two years. You are dying. You are dying. You want to defend yourself. He said, keep quiet. He's teaching you how you will come to a point where you can become a conduit pipe through which his dimensions can flow through you. This is how men are made in the kingdom. There are people who go and recite scriptures about power. You will quote it for many years. You will not see the hand of God. You will believe it in your head, but your spirit can't conduct it. Because for your spirit to conduct it, you must come under the government of the Holy Ghost. For Jesus, he said, suffer it to be so for now. What is it the Lord is telling you to do that is still a struggle? You are praying and fasting to see God move through you. It will never happen until you come to the point where you say, Suffer it to be so for now. It will cost you something. You must be shaped and chiseled by God to come to a point where you can conduct His dimensions. Many don't know because they are not taught. So we think it's all about doctrine. There is a place where Christianity becomes life. That's where it becomes personal. Where the Lord will tell you, He say, a Mecca, do this. If you don't suffer it to be so for now, you will never be a candidate that the Lord will use. 
and it will be a shame because there is a move of God coming. And any young man who is not a part of it is already behind. Suffer it to be so for now. When you do that, something happens. In the spirit realm, you become visible. Listen, the devil is not threatened by every Christian. The devil is threatened only by Christians who are obedient to the Holy Ghost. Because he knows that people who are obedient to the Holy Spirit are the candidates that the Holy Ghost will use. God only uses people who are yielded. He doesn't use people who are special. Because it is his resources that we need to do what he wants you to do. Everything you have apart from him is rubbish. The Bible said it will be burned by fire. So the devil is afraid of a man that begins to obey God. The moment he checks your life and discovers whatever God says, you begin to obey you become visible in his radar. And the moment that happened for Jesus, the next location for Jesus was the valley of temptation. That's why you begin to obey God and it looks as if life becomes more difficult. What is happening is that you have become visible in the radar. The principalities will spot you and say, Kai, because everybody that's in the world, the Bible calls them the sons of disobedience. Ephesians 2 verse 2. They are under the government of Satan. Who is this one that is choosing to obey God and not Satan? The moment it happened, your name appears in the radar, in the spirit. And the devil begins to trace you. He begins to trace you. And he traced Jesus and came to meet him in the valley of temptation. And the first thing he asked him, are you the son of God? Because only sons of God obey the will of God. Jesus said concerning the Pharisees, he said you are sons of the devil and his will you will do. Any man who begins to obey God immediately sustains the status of the son of God. So the devil traced Jesus. The man appeared in the radar. Suddenly, he found a man on earth who is willing to obey the Holy Spirit. Who is this man? And he began to locate him. But Jesus was wise. Before Satan came, he built his spirit man. There are many Christians who want to obey God, but they are not building themselves. That's why in the day of trouble, you will faint. And the Bible says if you faint in the day of trouble, it's not because God is not faithful. It's because your strength is little. Jesus had better understanding. He knew the devil would come. So before the devil came, he embarked on 40 days prayer and fasting. Remember, he was not tempted while he was fasting and praying. The, devil, the Bible said, after he had fasted and prayed, he was afterwards and hungered, and the tempter came. So before the devil came, Jesus built himself. You have made up your mind to obey God. Now that you have chosen to obey God, what are you doing? The guy said, whatever God says to do, I will do. He came for the meeting. He lay down. He was crying. Lord, have your work in my life. And the next day, he's on Facebook, chatting for four hours. You'll be a puppet in the hands of the devil. Because you don't understand the implication of the decision you have made. Every time you make a decision for God, you have made a decision against the devil. And there is no middle ground. Either you are an enemy of God or you are an enemy of the devil. If you are an enemy of the devil, he will come for you. He will come. So while you choose God, the next thing to do is to begin to build yourself in prayer and in fasting. Jesus stayed there for 40 days and 40 nights. He was imputing substance into himself. He was building stature in the spirit. He was incubating himself in the spirit. Nobody was talking to him. The Bible said he was in the wilderness with the wild beast. Remember, the angels came after he passed the temptation. Most of us are fasting and praying and then we are closing one eye. We want to see light appear from the wall. The light doesn't show while you are fasting and praying. It is when you begin to pass spiritual tests. That's when you begin to have those encounters. Because the angels come to strengthen you. Jesus was fasting and praying for 40 days. All he had were white beasts. But he didn't bother himself. Because at that time, he didn't need a distraction of an encounter. He needed to build his spirit. Most of us here, the Holy Ghost is giving us specific instruction on what to do in this season to build ourselves. Your own may be study the word, study the word, study the word. Every day the Holy Ghost is saying study, study. You say, I will read the Bible today. You go and carry the New Testament. You divide it into 14 chapters every day. You say, uh, between January, I will read the first four books. And then you plan everything in your head. No obedience. There are some of us that the Holy Ghost have been troubling us. Say, pray, 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 pray. Some fast, fast, fast. Some give, give, give. You will shut it down and you'll be doing Christianity because you think it's religion. You don't know that God is bringing you into a place of intimacy. 
For Jesus, the Bible said, the Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. He said, therefore, he fasted and prayed for 40 days and 40 nights. I didn't come today to do matters of doctrine. Because you don't disciple people in one night. But I came to show you how to activate your spiritual potentials. You will obey the law of righteousness. And when you are done, you will build your spirit man. It is your responsibility. In Leviticus 6.12, he said that fire on the altar must not be put out. He said that priest must put wood on it every morning. You are the one who put wood. It's not God. So what God is telling you to do, that prayer God is telling you to pray, better pray now. Because if you don't pray now, you will pray tomorrow for deliverance. The prayer you are supposed to pray now to build stature with God. If you don't pray now, you will pray tomorrow for deliverance. Jesus had understanding. So he prayed and fasted before the devil came. What is it the Lord is flashing in your heart? He said, do, do, do. And you are procrastinating. You say, I will do it next week. And next week has become next month. Next month has become next year. There is no time. The Bible said, today is the day of salvation. After you choose to obey God, the next thing you do is what? You build your spirit. You build your spirit. You build your spirit. Because the tempter will come. And when the tempter comes, instead of falling, it becomes a ground of promotion. Temptations are meant for people who are developed for their promotion. But men who are not built is a place of falling. So every time you fall, you did not fall because the devil was strong. You fell because you didn't build yourself. That temptation was the strategy of God to promote you. Because for Jesus, three came. Three different temptations. The same temptation that Adam fell in the garden. What was the difference between Jesus and Adam? It was preparation. Both of them were tempted for the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. But why did Jesus stand and Adam fell? It was preparation. Adam was gallivanting in the garden and enjoying himself. Jesus was fasting and praying. So when the devil came with the same temptation, Jesus was promoted. Adam lost his authority. It was from that promotion that the Bible said concerning Jesus that he went in the power of the Spirit. But it was from the same promotion, from the same temptation, that the Bible said Adam lost his authority to the devil. What you call a fall, what you call a temptation, is a divine orchestration for your promotion. The difference is your level of preparation. When a man begins to have periodic temptation from the devil, what you should know is that his time of temptation of, of promotion is due. And the devil is aware, so he comes before God. And God allows it like that. Because every man in this world must be tested. The Bible said, I the Lord, I test the rims. I try the heart to give unto every man as his ways should be. So promotions come to people who pass test. Promotion is not available to everybody. It's only available to men that pass the test of the divine. And for Jesus, he passed the test because he prepared himself. What is the level of preparation you have now? Most times you are in church, they give us position because there are no people. Because the youth, maybe nobody is on ground who is ready to serve God. You are the only person who comes for service. They say, become youth president. And you think you have stature. You are joking. Because the moment you leave that church and go out, you can't represent God. It's not about church. This thing is about territories. When the devil comes, he fights the systems. He fights the territories. It is in the territory that our life is lived. How many, how many hours do you spend in church? You go to your workplace seven times, five times in a week. And you spend roughly six to seven hours. That's where your life is lived. That's where the devil will wait for you. When you come to the church, for example, you are among people. So the devil knows that you will even pretend. And even if you are not pretending there is security from corporate alignment, the devil will fight you when you are at home with your wife. You are at home seven times, seven days a week. You are at home in your house every day. That is where you are not ashamed to hide yourself. If you want to know who a man is, ask the wife. He will tell you, forget, those things happening in church is a show. He knows that man because that is who he is at home. So we don't build our spirit. And if our wives, our brothers and our sisters know us, do you think it's principalities that don't know you? They watch you. They watch out for you. Jesus said that prince of this world come to me and find it nothing. These are the tests he passed before his life became a chamber. And the moment Jesus left the mountain of temptation, the Bible said his fame went abroad. Instantly, Jesus will see the blind people that he was seeing in Nazareth 
since he was a child and he could do nothing about and he said open and then the blind eyes open you you stand up because you read in the bible that jesus told the blind eye to open then you come you lay hand you say open and he say you check are you seeing anything first say nothing you lay your two hand again you say open but do this try and error <laughs> the man passed the test of righteousness he passed the test of preparation and he passed the test of the devil when he returned the bible said he returned in the power of the spirit that is the virtue we are talking about that's what you need for service for the virtue of service to be activated in your life you must pass the test of righteousness that thing the holy ghost keeps telling you you will obey it the day you obey that's the day you can serve god because the bible said when your obedience is fulfilled then then you can avenge other disobedience that preparation the holy ghost has been summoning you into you must prepare yourself and then you will you will prove you will prove to the devil that you are truly the child of god at that time virtue flows naturally that was when jesus came and told the deaf ear to open and the deaf ear could no longer stop because the devil that was in the deaf ear tempted him on the mountain and he defeated him he saw a woman he said oh not this woman the daughter of abraham we are all the seeds of abraham but why is one having authority and another one doesn't have it is the protocol that they obey you come for a meeting somebody is praying one believer is praying for another believer to be healed what is the difference it is the virtue that flow through them both of them have the same authority in christ both of them have the name of jesus at their disposal both of them have eternal life in their spirit both of them have the faith of the son of god what is the difference in some cases both of them even know the same scripture the difference is the virtue that flows meanwhile healing is supposed to be for children who are not grown but a man who obeys God and takes responsibility in the kingdom, he grows, he's no longer a child. At that time, he can administer healing. That's why one believer can pray for another believer. The difference is the flow of virtue. The flow of virtue. And that is what we determine what God will have you do in this kingdom. You can fight for position in the church because it is done. Because many churches have become very big institutions. People fight for position to become bishops and all of that. Men can honor you, but the honor of spirits come to men who pass their test. Not many Christians are willing to go through the process. We carry big Bibles to show people that we are readers of the Bible. But it's, there is something beyond reading the Bible. We talk so much so that people will think we know God. The knowledge of God is an experience of His reality. A man who goes through the fire with the Holy Ghost is the man that can truly tell that the Holy Ghost saves in time of trouble. It is a man who goes through the, the valley with the Holy Ghost that can tell the saving grace of God. And what God wants you to do is to journey with Him so that He will teach you how your hand can become strong. The service of God is predicated upon the virtue that flows through your life. And the virtues that flow through your life is predicated upon the laws that you obey. Jesus showed us three things. He said you must pass the test of righteousness. You must pass the test of preparation. And you must pass the test of the devil. Every man that passes these three tests, the life of God flows through him naturally. These are not things we force. These are things that we are because they flow through us on account of our nature. But how will that get open? It is when you follow the Holy Spirit. That's why the Holy Ghost comes to you as a government. The Bible said, except a man be born again, he cannot perceive the kingdom of God. That means when a man is born again, the first thing God does is that he brings him under a government. That man is still schooled by darkness. What he knows in his mind are the things that he heard from his grandfather. The things that he picked from the street by societal educational system. But when he comes into the kingdom, he begins to perceive a new syllabus. And the Holy Ghost comes to teach him the ways of God. But many reject the way of God. And they want to move in the power of God. It doesn't work like that. This morning we will pray. This is just the first capsule. We will pray this morning. Because if God will use us to do anything meaningful, it is to the degree of our yieldedness. It is not how long we've been in church. It is not even a function of the position we bear in church. It is not a function of what men call us. 
It is a function of who we are with God. And God knows His own to the degree that they yield to Him. When God calls, will you be there to answer? When God has a need, can He bank on you? For Jesus, He was a free theater. Jesus said, the works of my Father, I must do. He said, and I must do it while it is day. For the night cometh when no man walketh. Paul said, for woe unto me, woe. Do you know what it means? I am cursed if I don't do the work of God. How do men get to such a place where their life doesn't count anymore? Only what God wants them to do matters to them. A man will look up and say, woe unto me. Is it for necessity? It's laid on me to preach the gospel. What can you say about the work of God that is in your hand? Can you, have you come to a point where you say, let me be cursed if I don't do what God will have me do? Or you are still at a point where you are struggling. Say, Lord, uh, you know, this thing is hard. Uh, man, my brother, um, uh, this thing will be smart, you know. And uh, small, small, and small, small. In the days of this man, sometimes for, the, for months, every night they prayed for nations. Every night, Paul will stand up and say to a church, he say, I thank my God that I pray in tongues more than all of you. How much sacrifice goes into prayer? How can one man pray more than a congregation? Some of them, there were nights for years that they never slept. He said, my little children, of whom I travel again in prayer, until Christ be formed in you. That's, that's a father. For him, fatherhood is not a title. Fatherhood is to really beget people in the spirit. And the way to do it is to travel in prayer. So there were years where Paul could not sleep. Even while he was in prison, he had burden for Timothy. He was in prison, he wrote letters to Timothy. Letters to Titus. How do they come so deep in God that the burden of God becomes their body? At some point, what they needed to do was to obey the Holy Ghost. A point came when their heart became one with the Holy Spirit. So anything the Father wanted to do, He could use them willingly. These men gave up their lives. He said, Paul and Barnabas. He said, these be the men that have started their lives for the gospel. What are you willing and can do for God? The service of the mortars is not a function of skill and dexterity. You may be good at decoration, but it's deeper than decoration. You may be good at singing, it's deeper than singing. What can you do for God? And what compartment of service can you stand and the life of God can flow through you? Let's stop bragging of how long we've been in church. Let's stop bragging of titles. To what degree can God be seen through your life? How many people have been affected because of your life? I've read stories that made, made me made me sleep, I go through nights without sleeping. How that man like Renhabonke will come to a store, nobody knew him. And then he wants to buy something and somebody looks at him and begins to cry. And he say, Lord, why is the person crying? And he said, because he saw me in your eyes. Men go to a level where they don't need to talk about Jesus. They breath from their nose to preach Jesus. If you look at their eyes, God will touch you. How do men get to that point? Men like A.A. A. Allen will come to a, demon, a demoniac and he will say, I am A.A. A. Allen and a demon will flee. How do they get there? Is it not the same God we have? A man will come to a point where he's willing to die for the gospel to be preached. The same gospel that I'm struggling to give my money for. And then I hope to go to the same heaven with them and share in the glory. Am I not joking? No wonder we shout so much in our services. We labor to have many speakers and volume, yet nothing happens. In their days, they had no speakers. One man shouting in the wilderness to 5,000 people, and the power of God is still moving. You are Yahweh. Hey. You are Yahweh. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Can you whisper something to the Lord? Can you whisper something to the Lord? That teaching is in three fold. I just gave you the first fold.
Sit down for a moment. I just, I just intended this evening, especially the young people in the house, to show us how God works with men. There's a way God works with men. There's a place of studying the Word of God to know about the mind of God. But that will only bring harmony to your mind. What brings harmony to your spirit is your obedience to the Holy Spirit. That's why I use those illustrations to give you the first part of this teaching. Because Jesus was the Word. At the age of 12, the Bible already said He grew in wisdom, in favor, and in stature. So Jesus did not have a challenge with doctrine. He did not have a challenge with understanding. He knew everything about God. For Jesus to demonstrate the dimensions of God, he needed to go to the gate of obedience. It's important to understand doctrine. It's important to understand truth. But to walk in reality, we must obey the government of the Holy Spirit. And that's where many Christians are lacking. We talk righteousness, but we live in sin. And then to make things worse, we hide and sin. And the Bible said, the man that concealed his sin, shall not receive the message of God. So we hide it. Demons, educators, we now hide. What we should bring out and cry for mercy, we hide it. So we are enslaved for a long time. Obedience is too important in this kingdom. When the virtue comes, what do you do with it? That's the second phase of the teaching. Remember, you must pass the law of righteousness. The Holy Ghost will trouble you. I tell you the truth. He will not let you be. The reason is because there is something that was planted in you before the foundation of the war that the Holy Ghost will not let you be until that is manifest. You may be a prophet. You may be a leader. You may be a, a, a singer. You may be a, a, a host of the presence of God and it's still in your spirit because you receive all spiritual blessings in Christ. The Holy Ghost will not let you. He wants it to manifest through your soul and in your life. That's why He will keep troubling you. And it's through obedience that it will be activated. So you must pass the law of righteousness. You must pass the law of preparation. And you must pass the test of the devil. All of this, the Holy Ghost will guide you through. But when the virtue is released, how do you manage it? We need to know how the virtue is activated. We need to know how the virtue is managed before we even talk about service. Because we can come here and say, serve God like this, serve God like this, serve God like this. And then you go, you, you say, okay, um, okay, my own service to God is to pray for the sick. And then you pray for three years. And then not one person is healed. Those days when we started, you go and pray for somebody, you will sweat, and then you will feel the power of God on your body. When you leave, after three days, they will call you and say, Man of God, that sister have died. Then you go back and cry. Why, Lord, why? When you pray for the person, you felt goosebumps, goose pimples all over you. So you say, kai, kai, kai. the power of God was strong. After four days, they'll call you and say, the sister couldn't make it. So it down on us that this thing is beyond sensation. Yeah. <laughs> it's a flow of virtue. Healing is a virtue. He said, many touched him and virtue flowed out of him. So that you charge and sweat. If virtue doesn't flow, nothing happens. I was telling my friend the other day, I say it's faith and virtue that produce results. <laughs> faith comes by the revelation of God's word. Virtue comes by the obedience of the Holy Spirit. So many know the revelation. They believe it, but they don't see results because virtue is not flowing. Many times that Jesus healed, the Bible says virtue flowed out of him. Jesus had faith. In fact, it's the faith of Jesus that you and I have. The Bible said we have the faith of the Son of God. But do we have the virtue of the Son of God? So as young preachers, we go preach, we pray for the sick. Sometimes we fast before we go there. And then we charge when we are praying as if the building will collapse. And then on the strength of that vibration and the, the, the feelings... We assume that this one, 
we made declarations and when we leave after four days the person dies so when we came back checking with the holy ghost what is wrong what is wrong lord we believe we believe we believe that was when the holy ghost began to teach some of us he said there's no virtue how do i walk in virtue and god began to show me you are full of disobedience how can virtue flow Ah, uh-uh. it's obedience now part of healing i thought i have authority in the name of jesus they are organic realities you will argue it until you go to the field of missions you know most of the things we argue in church is because we are in church when we go to the mission field the argument will stop you will tell a young <laughs> you will tell a young believer that it's not every demon that lives because you say jesus jesus and then the prayer will say what do you mean in the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. And then the sons of Skiva argued until they went to the field of mission. And before they called the name of Jesus, the demon called the name of Jesus for them. <laughs> he said, Jesus, I know. So no need to call the name. You think when you call the name, then the demon will bow. Then the demon now called the name Jesus. Then your doctrine will collapse. You will now know that there is a role that obedience plays in this matter. You know what Paul was teaching? Paul said we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. <laughs> Far above principalities and powers. That's Paul's teaching. So in the name of Jesus, and there is no argument, it's very correct. In the name of Jesus, you and I, we are far above principalities and powers. We have authority in the name of Jesus. We have authority over principalities and power. But there are two dimensions to the use of the name of Jesus. The first dimension is when we proclaim it and then the authority is released. The second dimension is when we walk under his government. That's why the Bible said we are gathered together. It's a where two or three are gathered in my name. That type is not to proclaim. That one is to stay under. So for you to have authority over principalities and powers, you don't just call the name of Jesus. You must be under the government of that name. That's why when Paul began to teach about the dynamics of warfare in Ephesians, the same Ephesians chapter 6, he said when you fight principalities, you use Rhema, you don't use the name of Jesus. So the name of Jesus is the government that gives you authority over the princes. But the weapon you use to fight is the Rhema of the Holy Spirit. And the Rhema of the Holy Ghost comes to the ones that are in the spirit. So there are a lot of Christians in the flesh calling the name of Jesus. They don't see results. That's why I always tell people, we don't fight principalities with the name of Jesus. We have authority over them because we are under the name of Jesus. We fight them with Rhema. That's why I said you fight with the sword of the spirit. So the name of Jesus is the government under which you have authority over principalities. But the tool of warfare is the Rhema word. So a man who is not under the authority cannot do business in the spirit. And he will argue the doctrine with you until he goes to the field of mission. <laughs> When you enter mission field, then you, you will learn some things better. When you see men doing exploits in the kingdom of God, my brother, check their life. They are first of all strong in life before they are strong in doctrine. The Bible said concerning Jesus, of what that he both began to do and teach. So you cannot transform anybody unless you yourself, the word of God, first of all, have transformed you. That's why there are not too many revivalists. Because it's not about shouting, You are sinning! You will die! See! God hates you! You will shout like that. People will look at you and laugh. Unless that thing has authority over you first. And if you, if he has authority over you, even if it's five minutes of your clip, people here, they will be set on fire. Because you are speaking from the womb of fire. The fire is burning in you. So when you talk, your words come with fire. You don't need to tell people, God will judge sin. When they hear you, they will, they will sin will be choked in their life. Because we are talking fire. How do you manage the virtue of God? The first way to manage it is to engage it in prayer. Paul laid hands on Timothy and placed grace upon his life. But Paul told Timothy, he said, he should find to flame. First Timothy 1 verse 6. He said, he should find to flame gift of God that was in him. Fan it to flame. When you receive virtue, you don't just say, now I have the healing anointing. You will, you will be surprised. That you will pray today, 50 people will be healed. And then you wake up tomorrow. And then you come and say, the Lord has put a rod of healing in my hand. And then you scream and not one person will be healed. 
because the oil must be on fire the virtue you receive from god must be on fire go and read about jesus periodically periodically the man was praying periodically in matthew chapter 8 from verse 1 the bible said he returned from the mountain and the moment he returned from the mountain he began to heal the sick instantly the bible said they brought a leprous person to him he healed him he healed him and then in verse 16 17 the bible said when the evening was come they brought all that were sick and possessed of devils he healed them all and then suddenly another crowd came the bible said jesus when he heard that the crowd were there he gave commandment that they should depart where did they depart to they were going to the other side he told the apostles to go he went back to the mountain they crossed the river he met them and he met the, the gathering mania he rebuked the spirit and the guy was clean he came back the next day he carried peter james and john to the mountain jesus serviced the virtue that he has consistently with prayer see some people here here you talk and they say okay you have utterance how do you flow with the utterance they don't know before you come to preach if you don't take time to pray in tongue for long first you will not enter into the realm of inspiration you'll be talking and you'll be dry secondly even your tongue will not be fluid you will be wondering ah, how come i can't flow because you must service every grace that is given to you and the first place to service grace is on the altar of prayer many christians don't pray that's why even the gift they have is as if it's lost the gift is not lost but the gift needs to be set ablaze all the time on the altar of prayer that's why wise men pray as if they, their life depends on it babes go to pray to ask god for things but the mature believers go to pray as a lifestyle so that god flows through them on ending many christians don't have a life of prayer and that's why even the things you have with god you can't manifest it for some of us it's not like the virtue has not come the virtue is there but we can't demonstrate it because there's no prayer prayer is what sets your gifts on fire the bible calls the gift of the spirit the manifestation of the spirit it is the flow the charisma of the holy spirit but for that charisma to find expression through you you must constantly be in prayer that's why i told you already he said that priest is his responsibility to keep the fire burning you have a gift from god how well do you service it by prayer it's not enough because spiritual things are not like this microphone that i have anytime i want to use it i carry it no spiritual things are a flow they are a life so they are expressed through intimacy and one of the greatest ways to activate those possibilities is by prayer a man who does not make prayer a lifestyle cannot flow so much in the things of the spirit even though he has it so you see men who are men of virtue. most of the time the reason is cast to see men of god it's not because they just want to be alone so that when they come out they will look no 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 brother every time you talk you release energy you are not seen you know but that you are with people and you are just talking talking you dissipate energy and over time even the things you have you cannot operate from that realm for you to operate you will still have to build up in prayer that's why paul said building up yourself do upon your most holy faith praying in the holy ghost what you have they are different energy level you have mingled with men you have talked and dissipated energy if you want to operate from that height you will still mount up you mount up he said they that wait upon the lord he said they shall mount up with wings they mount up with wings like the eagle then they come to a place of sufficiency that's why he said they run they don't faint they walk they, they don't get weary why they've mounted up to the realm of god so they walk from the sufficiency of god many believers don't make prayer a lifestyle let me tell you what you will be in god largely depends on your everyday living everyday living determines what you will be in god most people spend almost all their time just talking idle words and then they hope that one day they'll become something with god you are joking you must be in constant conversation with the personality whose influence you want to predominantly manifest through you anybody you stay with for long the influence of that person whether you like it or not will flow through you that's why we make prayer a lifestyle so that we keep engaging the holy spirit when you come out the charisma of the holy ghost flows through you naturally even the people in the negative supernatural knows better you will never see a herbalist who is mingling with people in town or oh boy how far now waiting to happen a herbalist where will you see him from 
Even when he's alone, he's talking. He's talking to the spirit constantly. He's in the forest. He's getting help. He's talking to the spirit. He knows that he must consciously build a connection with that spirit. If the spirit will flow through him. There was a time when Daniel, the king had a dream and he met Daniel for interpretation. Daniel said, give us time to go and pray. He said, there's a God in heaven that reveals secrets. He was still learning the art. A point came when prayer became his life. If he shows up and they said, there's a dream, he will begin to interpret immediately. He has stayed with the spirit to a level where the spirit travels with him. You don't spend time with God in prayer. Forget, my brother. You will not mount to so much. I, I, keep, I, I don't know how to emphasize this enough. The service of God is not that you are playing the keyboard. It's not that you are playing the drum. It's not that I'm preaching. That's not the service of God. The service of God is that I have the ability to demonstrate what God wants to do part time. So if I'm playing the keyboard and I cannot reveal God through that thing, I'm not serving God. I may be serving my ego and serving my pride because that is what I'm demonstrating. And for us to come to a point where we can demonstrate God, His intention and His will, we must be fused to Him continuously. That's when God can seize your mind and talk through your mind. God can seize your voice and speak through your voice because you are fused to Him. That's the service of God. And that's why we continuously serve this grace in prayer. You service it in prayer. Any grace you have that you don't service on the altar, soon enough we vanish. Not because God will retrieve the gift from you, but because you no longer have the capacity to demonstrate it. Every spiritual man knows it. And most times, for some of us who have become serious with God, the devil will not fight you with sin. For the baby believer, the devil can trouble him with sin, but not for the one who is growing. When you start growing in God, what the devil troubles you with is distraction. Distraction. You know you have come to a point where you have conquered sin. So he begins to distract you. So that you deplete spiritual energy or you are not able to gather spiritual energy. Distraction is the greatest undoing of a spiritual man. You will not know why you fasted and prayed for seven hours and then the moment you came out you saw three people and they want to talk and then you stand with them the moment you start talking you lose your peace the energy you have gathered the devil wants you to dissipate it when a spiritual man begins to grow in wisdom he manages spiritual energy he manages it like a child he knows how to gather energy and keep it he will not diffuse it you can pray and build energy and you will keep that energy for three days. You will leave your house, go somewhere and manifest the dimensions of God. And people around you will say, ah, ah, Oh boy, but we've been there together since morning now. How come? They don't understand. There's a system of managing spiritual resources. You have learned it. So every time, anything that grieves the Holy Ghost, you avoid it. You avoid it. These ones are not taught by saying, Read this scripture, read this one. It's organic life. It's organic life. You can't end up praying all through the day and then you come out prayer power that you generated for 12 hours and then you deplete it in 30 minutes. That's why people keep praying but they don't grow. They don't know why. People keep doing spiritual things. They don't move forward. They don't know why. They can't manage it. The Holy Ghost teaches us how to walk in the supernatural. And one of the ways is to keep engaging Him in prayer. You will build energy and you will keep it. So that every time God has a need, you have a virtue to demonstrate. Jesus had enough virtue any day, any time. Any day, any time. They touch him virtue. He knew how to keep it. He gathered it consciously. He was going to pray for the centurion servant. And the woman with the issue of blood came and drew virtue from him. Instantly he turned. He said, who touched me? He said, virtue have left me. He didn't build virtue to scatter anywhere. He kept it. He guarded it jealously. The woman drew virtue from him. He stopped. Everything he was doing, he stopped it immediately. He said, who, who touched me? Somebody have carried spiritual substance from me. These things are not meant to be wasted. People were running. Peter said, men were thronging him. He knew how to keep virtue in the market. He knew how to keep virtue in the office. You can't take it away from him. He gives it only by faith. So virtue leaves Jesus only when he walks in the economy of faith. 
But there are many believers today who don't know how to manage virtue. Say, so let's go for a retreat. He went for a retreat three days. And he came back that same afternoon. Everything he built in the retreat scatters. He's talking, the Holy Ghost is grief, but he's not wise enough to know that Kai, 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 what I'm doing is depleting spiritual substance and to keep. That's why men like Jesus, they were always in the place of prayer so that they will master spiritual things. He said, He that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. You are careful, you are modest, you are calm so that you don't waste. The second way to manage virtue is to be saturated with the Word of God. In Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23, he said, Guard your heart with all diligence. Out of it are the issues of life. What are the issues of life? Virtue. Virtue. The substance of life. He said, Guard it. But how do you guide your heart? In verse 20 to 22, before 23, he told us how to guide your heart. He said, My son, attend to my word. Give thy ears to my saying. Let them not depart from thy eyes. Keep them in the midst of thy heart. He said, for they are life to them that find them. And flesh, health to all their flesh. So the way to keep and to guide the virtues of God is to keep your heart saturated with the word of God. When a man is full with the word of God, the word of God becomes a defense. That's why somebody tells you you will die. Instead of fear, then you hear a scripture jump out of you. I shall not die, but live to proclaim the words of God. Because the word of God has saturated. It will preserve the substance of reality in your spirit. When you see people toast to and fro, it's because they are not full of the word. Paul said in 1 Timothy 4, 13 to 16, he said, until I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. Give attendance your attention to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. He said in the ending part of that scripture in verse 16, he said in doing this, you will both save thyself and them that hear thee. Any area you find challenge, or you find fear, or you find lack, it means that area, the word of God is not sufficient. The moment the word of God becomes sufficient, the substance of divinity begins to flow. That's why it said in First Peter, Second Peter chapter one verse three, he said he has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. But he said it is through the revelation of the word. Why am I taking time to share this? Because you will labor, you will labor on the word of God until it becomes real to you. He said, give attendance to reading. You will sit down and open the scripture and read it for yourself. There is a place for exhortation where somebody preaches the word of God to you. It has its place. He said, but you sit on the word and read it. How many Christians make reading the word of God a, a culture? Very few. That's why in our world today, many, very few have the power of God. How many Christians? We read all sorts of things. If there is a news, you go and read it, you check it on YouTube, you read it on Facebook, read it on Twitter. But you can't read the word of God. He said, give attendance to reading. These are the things that the fathers did as a lifestyle. They did it meticulously. Very diligently. You see men like Billy Graham. He said, every morning he begins his day with three capsules of the Psalms and one capsule of the Proverbs. Every morning. There are 150 chapters in the Psalms. 31 chapters in the Proverbs. So every month he reads the whole Psalms and Proverbs. He said he does that one for inspiration. That's not his Bible study. Three chapters of Psalm, one chapter of Proverbs every morning before he steps out of his house. And then you see Billy Graham talk in a stadium and 50,000 people give their heart to Christ. And for 66 years, Billy Graham was teaching only one gospel. For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. And people don't get tired of hearing it. And you think it's just the scripture. The same message, every crusade, Billy Graham, for God so loved the world. And then he talks about the cross. For God so loved the world. And then he's winning souls to in thousands. He's saturated with the world. Reading. Reading. How many Christians read the word of God? Very few. 
That's why we are struggling in almost every part of our life. And then it looks as if God is not faithful. The time we waste in crying, if we invest it in studying the word, a lot of things in our lives will change. Joel Austin's mother, the wife of John Austin, she was diagnosed with an incurable disease. And they told her she had three days or so to leave. After all the anointed men had prayed for her, no hope. It was concluded she had three days to leave. And the woman gathered 40 scriptures on healing and began to talk them to herself every day. Began to talk those scriptures. In a day she would recite those scriptures to herself more than a thousand times. And three days passed. Three months passed. Eight months passed. Ten years passed. She was still alive. There is something the world does to your spirit. You were created by the world. And the world is your spiritual DNA. That's why in 1 Peter 1.23 it says we are born of the incorruptible seed of the word of God. The word of God is your spiritual DNA. So if you want to keep the virtue of God alive and flowing through you, you must be rich in the word of God. Very rich in the word of God. He said let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Richly. Any area of your life where there is scarcity of the word of God, there is death. The devil doesn't even need to come. There is death already. Because your ignorance alone will incur death. He said, my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. Many don't make the word of God their life. When things happen, they are finding out what we God say or what we God do. That you are trying to find out what God says about it means you are already defeated. A man who is a victor, if there is any challenge coming, the word of God jumps at it. The word of God jumps at it. Pastor Chris said he meditated on healing scriptures when he was trusting God to anoint him with the healing, a healing grace. He meditated on healing scripture until even if he hits his leg on the stone, he said, Be healed. He has not even seen whether there is an injury, just be healed. He can't think otherwise. The word conditioned his mentality so much that a point came when he wants to pray for the sick. He doesn't even see the sickness. He sees their reality in the spirit. So you see sickness falling like, like a pack of cards before the man. And you say, is this man a spirit? Is the word of God that have made him that? That's why you hear him keep saying, what God wants to give you is not a healing. He said, it's the word of God in your spirit. That area where you have a challenge, there is a virtue in you that can conquer it. But the thing is, is the word of God there? The Bible, see, concerning us, concerning us, the believer, we have a higher economy of spiritual oppression. For the Hebrew, for the Jews, for instance, for them to be healed, they will say by his tribes, because there was a promise given to them in the law, by his tribes we were healed. So when Peter was talking to the Hebrew, he told them, by his stripes you were healed. But when Paul is talking to the Gentile, he doesn't refer them to the cross. He tells them, if that same spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead lives in you, he will quicken your mortal body. So it's a higher economy. You are not even subscribing to the scribe. There is an eternal life which is a healing mechanism on your inside. So you know what to do to generate healing from within you. It's a system of the word of God. Many are not full of the word of God. That's why we are defeated. Everything you need for life and godliness, the Bible says it has already been downloaded. It's already in you. But how can this thing find expression? Unless the word of God activates it. But many are not full of the word of God. Is virtue the problem for many people? No. The problem is prayerlessness and lack of engagement of the word of God. The apostle said something in Acts chapter 6 verse 4. He said we will give ourselves continually to the ministry of prayer and the word. They know how to sustain virtue. So Peter, James, John were not doing mighty things because they were apostles. They did what? They gave themselves continually to the ministry of prayer and the word of God. You want to sustain the virtue of God in your life? What do you do? Prayer and the word of God. There are many of them, but these are two basics. I'm leaving you with things that you will remember. There's nothing so mystical about the supernatural. Listen, Jesus himself said something. He said, unto you is given to know the secrets of the kingdom. There's nothing so mystical. 
When you see a man doing dangerous things in God, there's nothing special about him. There are laws and secrets that his life is given to. If you commit your life to the same, you will be shocked what will happen with you. Men like Peter Tan were ordinary men. Ordinary teachers of the word of God. But the point came where Peter Tan and his friend David, they decided to stay in the presence of God. And then they began to speak in tongues 48 hours, meditating on scripture 48 hours. After six months, six months, his friend David became a prophet. They see the spirit the way I'm seeing this door. And they, they diagnose people. If he sees you, he will tell you, I see a dark cloud standing behind you. And he said, this cloud I'm seeing is not a demon. Based on what I'm seeing, he will begin to decipher the cloud and tell you you had an attack two weeks ago based on the distance of that cloud from you. This is in the spirit realm. And then he begins to tell you about the accident you had two weeks ago, where you had the accident, what the accident was intended to do, and what you need to do now is what will happen tomorrow. Is that a man? You will think, hey, this man has so there is nothing special. They knew secrets, they committed themselves to it. And one of the two basic secrets is prayer and the word. But men they don't make it their lifestyle. The time most of us spend on Facebook, if we give it to the word of God, our life will change in three months. I heard of a strange prophet from India, Savaraj. Savaraj did an experiment on tongues. Speaking in tongues and the activation of the supernatural. And he locked himself in the room. He prayed in tongues for four hours. His spirit became charged. He stretched for six hours. And he could begin to perceive things. Everything happened around the neighborhood. He was hearing it. As if they were talking into his ears. He stretched for eight hours. And all of a sudden, he began to see visions. He stretched for twelve hours. And when he opened his eyes, the whole of the room became like a screen. He was seeing the supernatural like a screen. People grow in God or see they experiment spiritual things. You, you are struggling to pray in tongues for three hours. Somebody has prayed in tongues as a lifetime until he is doing experiment with tongues. Those are the men that master spiritual things. They are masters because they've given their lives to this thing. Each and every one of us have the Holy Ghost, who is the governor of the spiritual. What do you do with the Holy Ghost? That's what we determine where you will get to with God. The question now is not who is more special than who. Jesus used four things when he was in this world. One, he walked with the faith of the Son of God. Two, he walked with the Holy Spirit. Three, he walked with eternal life. Four, he walked with the ministry of angels. You and I have the four commodities. So Jesus had no advantage beyond you because he was the word of God. The question is, what do you do with these four things? And one of the ways to engage it is what I've shown you. You see, I had I had the mind of making this a revival meeting before. But the Holy Ghost whispered to my heart. I received the knowing of the Spirit of God. He said, share these basic truths. There are many who desire to walk with the Lord, but they don't know how to go about it. There are many who desire to walk with the Lord. These are things virtually everybody knows. But the problem is the lack of engagement. You know these things, but you can't engage it. You know the place of obeying the Holy Spirit to activate things in your life, but you can't obey. The Holy Ghost struggles one person for three months in fast, fast, fast. And three months passes, he doesn't pass. And after three months, the desire for fasting vanishes. He doesn't know he has lost the season. A season has been lost. A window has been closed. The Holy Ghost comes to say, pray, 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 pray. He wants to sleep at night, he loses his peace. He wakes up in the night to drink water and pray, pray, pray. And he continues like that for one month. And then suddenly that voice dies. The person doesn't know he has lost the season. So the Lord brought me to re-echo re these things in our heart. These things mean more than just a call. They are summons. Moses had this body in Egypt. The time Moses God began to trouble him about the children of Egypt, they had been in captivity for 390 years. God had spoken to Abraham. 
that they were going to be in bondage for 400 years, then they will be delivered by a mighty hand. The time was drawing close, and God began to trouble Moses. When Moses missed that window, it was in the next 40 years that God visited again. So the children of Israel were in bondage for extra 30 years, because Moses lost the window by acting in the flesh. Some of the things some of our families are suffering is because we fail to respond to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Could it be that the reason your children are not married is because when God was prompting you, pray in the night, pray in the night, you refuse to pray for those three weeks. That's why your children are 30 something, they are not married. Could, it, could that be the reason? Could it be because God troubled you to fast for three months? Four years ago, you refused. That's the reason you are jobless to today. Could that be the reason? Because the principality that was resisting your success, there was a window of grace that was open. And when God was troubling you, say, rise now, rise now, rise now, you refused. Could that be the reason why you don't have a job? And you are going to Lagos, Abuja every day, seeking jobs, submitting appointments. Meanwhile, God moved on your account before now. The elders and the patriarchs, they understood the language of prompting. Elijah had locked the heaven for three and a half years until he bought a king. And he left everything and went to Oren. And he prayed there until God spoke. The reason they are invincible is not because they are born invincible. They knew the things to do to become invincible. You know the same thing. I said the problem we have is the problem of engagement. Could it be that you are not married till now because when the Lord said pray, 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 you took it for granted. And then the season of favor that God opened over your life was closed. And after that season you are attending vigils for three years, nothing has happened. See, there are kairos moments in the spirit. Jesus was entering Jerusalem in Luke 19.44. He said, there will be gnashing of teeth. He said, no stone will be left on top. He said, because thou knowest not the times of thy visitation. Could it be that you have missed your visitation too many times because you took for granted the promptings of the Holy Spirit? Could that be the reason why your sick soul is not working? Your vigils are not working? Because when God prompted you, you didn't respond. Could it be that you are the reason why you are stagnant all this while and you think somebody is bewitching you? When God brought your visitation, you were not there. The worst thing that happens to a man is to sleep in the day when he should be sown. Because in the day of harvest, he will be with lack. I want to talk to the young people now for the next 30 minutes before we begin to pray. What do you think life is? Have you sat down to contemplate the meaning of life before? What is the intelligence behind life? Have you sat down to contemplate why God gave you emotion in the first place? Most of us live for our emotion, for our appetite, for the things we desire. When we are angry, our lives take the direction of anger. When we are excited, our lives take the direction of excitement. Have you asked yourself, the one that put emotion in you, what reason, for what reason did he plant the emotion in the first place? Have you asked yourself, what role is your emotion supposed to play as you participate with the Holy Ghost to fulfill purpose? Have you asked yourself before? Most of us, when we take action, we take action based on intelligence. We judge this, judge this, judge this. And because this is reasonable, this is to our advantage, we take this action. Have you asked yourself, before the intelligent dimension of you was put in you, what did the one who put it have in mind? Have you asked some of these questions before? What would have happened to you if you didn't have emotion? Would your life have gone in the direction it's going? What would have happened to you if you were not an intelligent being? Would your life have gone in the direction it's going? If you suggest something very quickly, that your life is more important than what you feel. Your life is more important than what you think. And that is why we come to God first to draw a bearing for the direction that we should go. I'm saying this because most of us here are young people. A time will come when you will breathe your last. At 
you contemplated the possibility of where you will go to and what God will say concerning you? Now that you are young, you think you have time to do what you want to do because you love what you are doing. You think you have time to do what you want to do because you feel what you are doing is right. Have you checked with God to find out what will you have me do? The reason we receive virtue, the reason we manage virtue, virtue is because the king has something in mind. And the degree to which we deploy virtue in the direction of what the king desires is what defines the quality of our lives. The quality of your life is not defined by what you have. The quality of your life is not defined by how you look. The quality of your life is defined by the degree to which you deploy to the service of God. What has God created you to do and to what degree are you deploying your life? That's the first question I want to leave with young people this morning. If you have not come to that point where your life is spent for God, you have not begun to live. You may think you are doing well, my brother. Bread is only a lifespan. It's only a li- an air time that God gives you to find expression here. When bread is taken away, you will return to true reality. Have you asked yourself the question, by what, by what means do you think? By what means do you imagine? What will happen after now? Where will you go to? What happens to your imagination? What happens to your spirit? Have you contemplated this thing? The scriptures tell us clearly that God had a plan before he created us. And the reason we find God and seek God is to find that thing he wanted us to do when he designed us. John went to heaven and the 24 elders began to educate him. They told him everything was created for his pleasure. You inclusive, me inclusive. If I will give him pleasure, what is that one thing that I need to do before I can give him pleasure? And you discover that thing. If you have not discovered that thing, then walking with God every day is a sentence that you cannot do without. Until you find it, you have not begun to live. If you take a statistics among young people, 90% or more don't know why they are born. We are doing things because we see it in others, we copy from others, and we think we will have value. By the time the veil of the divide is lifted, you will discover that you didn't live in this world. You were here, you breathed oxygen with everybody, but you didn't leave. Because when God begins to take census, it's what he sent you here to do that will determine whether you live or not. Many are not alive. Many are living dead because they've not found why they are here. They are like cops walking on the street. They are like robots powered by many intelligence and many desires. The first quality of service we bring to God is the service of our life. That's why we have virtue. That's why we manage virtue. So that we can bring to God the service of our life. Our life will be in the hand of God for Him to do what He wants to do. Today, you are in Bayesa, not because you were born here. You are in Bayesa because God wants you to do something here. That's when your life becomes a service. If a man has not come to a point where his life is a service, he is not relevant with God. And a man who is not relevant with God, it would have been better he was not born. What is that thing that God wants to do in Bayesa today? That is because of Emmanuel that God can do it. That is God's life. If you think life has anything to do with oxygen, biology has deceived you. Life has nothing to do with oxygen. Everything we call life is summarized in the will of the Father. Jesus said, concerning me, it is written in the volumes of the book. I come to do that. What do you think that God wants to do that is because of you that that thing will be done? I was telling them in the day before yesterday, I said for the 12 apostles, their lives were pillars that God was using to sustain the new Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem because those guys lived, they were the foundation of that city. And you live for it, you are not alive, you are a dead man. Because the first place of service is the service of a life unto the Lord. Is your life being poured out as a drink of it? Who said our lives is poured out as a drink of it? That's a man who is alive. He said the life I live is no longer I that live it. It is the one who died for me. I live by the faith of the Son of God. Are you still holding to your ambitions? Are you still holding to your emotions? Are you still holding to your proclivities? You have not found the whispers of Zion. 
by the time you begin to hear the root pass of the God of heaven, your life will take a new direction. Jesus did not live in, in, in Nazareth because he loved the water. He did not live there because he was born there. The Bible said he beat his tent by the regions of Sidon that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali. Jesus lived there because by prophecy. That's the only place he was supposed to live. By Esa. Are you here because you think it's a place of greener pasture? You have not begun to live. Either you are still a baby or you are a dead man. What is it that God wants to do that your life is the only vent through which God can do it? You are still living for yourself? You think life is about self? You think life is about ambition? You think life is about desire? You were not well taught. Life is about the will and the interest of the king. Don't deceive yourself. You have no service to render to God if your life is first of all not given to you. God doesn't receive anything from any man whose life has not first of all been given to him. Go and read the whole scriptures. There is not one man God used that he first of all did not receive his life. For Abraham, he said, leave thy country, leave thy kindred, leave thy father's house, and go to the land that I will give you. He to give to Abraham. He changed his nationality. He changed his kindred. He changed his family name. Abraham lost everything that gave him relevance as a man. When you don't have a country, you don't have a kindred, you don't have a family, what is your identity? You have no identity anymore. Abraham lost everything that made him a man. He lost his life. He committed his life to God before God could use him. What is it you are still holding back from God? If your life has not become a sacrifice in the hand of God, you cannot provide service. Forget it. You can be singing in the choir. You can be leading the You can be preaching every Sunday. Don't be preaching now. You are making noise. Because God will first of all receive you before He receive what you have to offer. Ask your life to come and offer it in the hand of God. To church as a religious gathering. Because you were born a Christian, that means if you were born a Muslim, you would have been a Muslim. There's nothing special about you. What is it you are holding back from God? Tonight you are going to drop it at the altar. Everything you don't give to God becomes a weapon of self destruction. The Bible spoke about the Gadarin maniac. Satan gave him a stone and he used that stone to injure himself. Everything you keep from God is a weapon of self-destruction. The devil is deceiving you. You will use your ambition to destroy yourself. You will use your emotion to destroy yourself. You will use your appetite to destroy yourself. Many young ladies with future have been destroyed because they have appetites. They hit this away from God. The devil used it to destroy them. Many men with ambition have been killed because the ambition drove them away from God. What is it you are hiding from God? Today the great one comes for your life. The first point of service is the point of total surrender to God. It's not about the gift you have. God is not so impressed about your voice. Have you gone to heaven before? The Bible said there were thousands upon thousands. An angel can sing better than a thousand choir made of men. God is not moved by your voice. It is the supply of life that gives in glory. What life are you supplying? What's the quality of service you are supplying? Is that degree to which your life is surrendered? Are you surrendered this morning? You are a joker in church. You don't know the power. You don't know what to transpire. Make transpire the first question they ask. It's not him up to me. You must be first of all before he can hit you. You stand him. Elijah said, before God whom I stand. Before God whom I stand. You cannot serve a God that you are not given to until you are so out. You cannot be used of God. Do you know who John the Baptist was? His father is in the rank of priests. In the picture of priests are the most privileged people in society. The guy separated himself from his father. And he walked and looked, ate the roots, looked the roots. He was putting on cross and white honey. What he had for red men when Kermit came in. How can the son of a priest become a papa? Because there is a root they need to serve. In the wilderness, you will not have fulfilled that prophecy. Your ambition is taking you from purpose. Your picture is taking you away from destiny. From to take the work of his father and go to the wilderness. It was in the wilderness that he fulfilled the prophecy. He said, to the voice of the book, he said, The one that sent me, 
the same said unto me. Did you read about Moses? Moses was a prince in Egypt. Moses stood in the courts of Pharaoh. But the Bible said when Moses was come of age, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh. God took the man now. So he had to separate. He had to separate. What gave Moses the right to be the prince of Egypt? Because he's the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Do you know what Moses was doing? When he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, he was telling Egypt, I don't want to be your prince anymore. Because there is a place in the house of God. I need to serve in the house of God. And God did not just make Moses a prince. In Exodus chapter 7 verse 1, he said, I have made you a God unto Pharaoh. The God that did a bit in the flesh, but he rejected flesh and took God. Something happened. He became a God. And still delay yourself where you are. Because you don't want to commit your life to God for serving. God will never use you until you first of all give him your life. Giving your life to Christ is different from being born again. When you are born again, you receive the life of God. When you give your life to Christ, you want to serve. At that time, you don't have a decision over your destiny anymore. You can have a job and go through good to good. That's the direction you are going. It doesn't matter what your family says. Those are the men that can change the world. Such men are lacking in the job because we are top ambition. We are top ambition. We keep top ambition. Which that we tell you. In the third coming revival, are the men that are willing to give up their life. Are you one of them? God is not only interested in using you. God wanted, God wants to boast with you. God wants to show you to the devil and say, Have you seen Emmanuel? The devil is bragging in the spirit that he's the God over this world. God is looking for sons that he can boast to the devil. Have you seen Victor? Have you seen patience? Have you seen Patra? That's what God wants to do with your life. But the life of the flesh cannot host the glory. The Bible says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Why do you hold on to a life that cannot host the glory? The only life that can host the glory of God is the life of God Himself. And that's why you must give up your life for the life of God to flow through you. Many are holding on to their lives. We can't amount to anything in God. That's why you can't pray. That's why you can't give. Because your ambition still control you. Tonight, the first kind of service we will render to the Lord is to offer our lives as sacrifice. And this is not a doctrinal issue. We will pray it. We will pray it. We are going to pray in tongues for the next 40 minutes. And we will pray like you have never prayed before. Until that thing that keeps you from God breaks, then we will do a ministration of the Spirit. I hope you enjoyed this video and I believe that you were blessed. If um, you were blessed by this video, make sure that you click on the share button and share it to a friend. And also make sure that you like the video so that YouTube can recommend this video to other people so that they can also be blessed by the message. If you have any question, please make sure that you contact us and we'll get back to you. And also if you are watching this video, and you don't know Jesus Christ, ask the Lord and personal Savior. I want you to make that decision. Just contact us in the description. Call us and let us lead you to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. And lastly, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and turn on the, that notification bell icon. Turn it on so that when new videos are uploaded, you can be notified. Thank you so much and see you in our next video and prayer section. Bye.